So I will uh, uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the council workshop for Monday, December 14th at seven o'clock. Uh, this meeting is to be held entirely virtually, but uh, streamed. We have a resolution council that's been submitted to, uh, to hold the public meeting without the public in attendance. I have Councillor Mary moving. Is there a seconder? Second. That? Council, second by Councillor Back. Call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded. Motion carries. Uh, Council, we have an agenda that's been circulated. Are there any errors or omissions from the agenda as presented? <sighs> Hearing none, will someone move the adoption of the agenda? So moved. By Councillor Back, second by Councillor Hansen. Call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Contrary minded. Motion carries. Council, we have two sets of minutes that have been circulated ahead of the meeting. Moved. One from November 9th, one from November 23rd. Are there any errors or omissions from the minutes as presented? Hearing none, I hear it's uh, moved by Councillor Murray, second by Councillor Back. I'll call the question on that. All those in favor, contrary minded, the minutes are now adopted. We now have uh, two items, uh, two reports to address for tonight's meeting. The first uh, item up, number 3.1, is the Lynn Canyon Pay Parking uh, Pilot Project. And I believe my notes say that first I'm to go to Mr. Joyce on this. Uh, there you Correct. Go. Good evening, uh, Your Worship and Council. Um, during the November Transportation Workshop in 2019, Council endorsed the use of pay parking as a demand management tool. Uh, the implementation of a seasonal pay parking pilot at the Lynn Canyon parking lot was endorsed for the beginning of the 2021 season. Um, what we have, we have a, uh, about a 10 minute presentation by Mr. Carney on how we plan to introduce this concept and staff uh, are also available to answer questions uh, upon the conclusion of the presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Carney. Mr. Carney, you're muted. It's always got to be someone. Got to be someone. <laughs> Thank you, um, Mr. Joyce, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, pleasure to be here uh, this evening. I, I do have a presentation, so I will share my screen. And if you could. Please tell me if that's sharing um, the title page, uh, Lynn Canyon Pay Parking Pilot. You're good, Steve. In full screen, excellent. Okay, uh, again, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. We are here tonight to present uh, staff recommendations uh, related to the Lynn Canyon Pay Parking Pilot, uh, scheduled for launch in March of 2021. Uh, as you know, uh, Lynn Canyon Park is uh, exceptionally uh, popular, uh, attracting more than 1 million uh, visitors annually. Uh, one of our most popular destinations. Um, uh, demand for the parking uh, at Lynn Canyon uh, Park uh, reaches upwards of 2,500 vehicles per day during the peak uh, summer periods. Uh, in 2017, uh, the Ecology Centre welcomed over 90,000 uh, visitors and so um, by all measures, a, a, an extremely a popular destination. Um, uh, further to that, in 2017, uh, sorry, in 2018, uh, the district implemented a, um, a commercial vehicle or tour bus, a permitting system uh, to help regulate the number of tour buses arriving at the park at any given time um, uh, on a, a daily uh, a, a basis. Uh, this year, uh, a number of um, uh, safety and, and, and circulation improvements were made to the, uh, the Lynn Canyon parking lot. Uh, those include a pedestrian only area in front of the Ecology Center and Cafe, uh, improved circulation for vehicles, improved access for first responders, um, in, enhanced accessibility um, uh, features uh, for um, uh, uh, ex accessibility impaired uh, visitors. Um, improved signage, a wayfinding, uh, also uh, best practices for stormwater infiltration, uh, and also uh, drop-off zones for uh, tour bus uh, visitors at the Ecology Center. Um, just going back to uh, some of the conversations that we've had over the past year around um, demand management, um, particularly around the parks, um, You'll recall back in uh, November of last year, in 2019, at our annual transportation workshop, we discussed 
um, uh, pay parking as a demand management tool. Uh, and we've had a couple of conversations since then on uh, parking management, uh, specifically related to, to the uh, on-street parking a policy that we've created this year, and also other initiatives that have taken place around demand management. Uh, pay parking is uh, considered very effective in terms of a TDM or transportation demand management. Uh, it encourages the use of sustainable modes of transportation, including transit, cycling, walking, um, and also helps to, in certain cases, helps to uh, spread out demand over um, uh, larger periods of time. So not all uh, visitors, for example, are arriving uh, at, the, at the same time, essentially. So um, uh, some of the associated benefits uh, include uh, environmental benefits, uh, such as reduced uh, emissions, uh, and also um, a reduced demand for infrastructure. And by that, I mean both uh, traditional road widening projects and also parking lot expansion projects. And so through the um, through the careful application of, of certain demand management tools, we can uh, uh, um, address some of these needs and again, reduce demand for some of this infrastructure. Um, uh, TDM or pay parking as a demand management tool uh, was uh, endorsed by uh, council in principle uh, during our 2019 uh, transportation workshop at, as mentioned. Um, other um, uh, TDM or tra uh, transportation demand management tools uh, include um, on-street parking restrictions, which we'll talk about a little bit in, in a little bit more detail um, uh, tonight. Uh, shuttle bus service, for example, um, again, improved active transportation infrastructure, including, um, you know, uh, sidewalk expansion, um, cycling infrastructure, crosswalk improvements, um, tr transit related, uh, e-bike share, for example, and also again, a, a parks reservation system, which is something we're seeing quite often now with uh, ski resorts and also um, uh, BC Parks implemented that this year to, to alleviate or to address some of the uh, peak uh, demands at uh, BC Parks uh, over this past summer. Um, yeah, so during the, the workshop that we had last year in November, uh, again, we did discuss uh, the use of pay parking as a demand management tool. Uh, and yeah, we, we spoke about it again in, in June uh, during a second uh, parking workshop. Um, and it's, it's important to note that uh, Metro Vancouver <clears throat> is also um, uh, planning for a, um, a pay parking pilot at the Lynn Headwaters Park in 2021. And so we've been in co close coordination with Metro Vancouver uh, in terms of um, uh, the scheduling and sort of the, the spillover effects you, uh, of um, what a pay parking facility may potentially do if, if unless it's addressed in through off street parking policy uh, measures. Um, the pay parking that we are proposing would be in effect for eight months of the year, so a seasonal pay parking. Uh, and this is in coordination with, again, with Metro, uh, would be consistent with Metro. Uh, and so that would be essentially March 1st until October 31st. Uh, and we are looking at um, a, a rate or proposing a rate of $3 per hour uh, for a maximum of three hours to encourage uh, turnover in the parking facility itself. Uh, as mentioned, um, changes to the on-street regulations surrounding uh, Lynn Canyon Park and Lynn Headwaters Park uh, would be uh, quite uh, critical. And so we're, we are aware of that and we're working to implement um, uh, our on-street parking policy or to roll out regulations in, in accordance with our new on-street parking policy. Um, and having said that, we are looking at being proactive in the sense that um, we would be rolling out some of these on-street parking restrictions in anticipation of the March 1st launch date. And so there's some uh, planning that's happening right now in terms of what, you know, what those areas would look like. And then the intent would be to implement, implement that uh, as, uh, for the March 1st launch and then monitor and adjust uh, uh, as needed. And we do anticipate that it would be a, um, a combination of um, resident parking only and the uh, time restricted with resident exemption parking restrictions on the on the uh, residential streets surrounding uh, the Lynn Canyon and Lynn Headwaters parks. Uh, what we have found in the past um, is that 
Uh, we have approximately 25% of the park visitors are DNV residents. Uh, the remaining uh, visitors are about 35% from Metro Vancouver, 20% uh, uh, from anywhere in BC and about 20% international. So qu quite, a, quite a mix, obviously a, a regional if not in international destination, but again around 25% are DNV residents. Uh, and that does vary seasonally. Um, during the summer months, you know, you would expect uh, a higher percentage of uh, tourists. And then in the off season, it's a higher percentage of um, uh, DNV residents. Um, and as per council direction, we are proposing uh, that DNV residents would be eligible uh, for an annual parking permit, uh, similar to the RPO system that we have in place. And so that would be at a cost of approximately $30 per year. And that's uh, the cost is really designed to essentially be a, a cost neutral program. And so no revenues expected from the permitting system. And like I say, that would exempt uh, residents from the hourly rate. Uh, we have four disability stalls and two staff parking stalls that would be exempt uh, from payment. So in total, we have 129 uh, parking spaces. Um, it's important to note, I think that, um, and this is a graphic that we prepared uh, a couple of years ago when we introduced the, um, the commercial vehicle um, uh, uh, permitting system uh, to, um, uh, to advise or notify the, the tour bus operators as to uh, where, they can, where they can park without uh, restrictions. And that is at the top of Lillooette Road. And so uh, just a reminder that that parking remains uh, free. Um, and so um, there, there are um, uh, essentially zero cost options for people that wish to access the park. Um, in addition to this area, there's approximately 100, uh, 100 vehicle parking spaces along the gravel road uh, between um, Lynn Canyon Park and Ross Road. And we're not proposing that those um, uh, spaces are, uh, are that there's a payment required for those spaces. So there would be some free parking available there as well. And again, that's a gravel road. So it would be at this stage uh, fairly difficult um, to, to incorporate that area into the pay parking pilot, uh, but not to say that at some point in the future, it couldn't also be considered. Um, again, as per council direction, um, DNV residents would be eligible for the, uh, the annual parking um, uh, pass or parking permit. Um, <clears throat> and so we've adjusted our revenue forecasts uh, based on that. Um, revenues are expected to be, uh, when we factor in the 25% the of the visitors and deduct the, um, the staff and disability uh, or dis disability parking spaces, um, we project revenues in the order of around 300 to 600,000, uh, 635,000. Uh, and that, that upper range is um, really, a, a, um, we're probably going to land somewhere in between these two numbers. Uh, that upper range would, as, would assume the, that the parking lot is fully occupied for eight months, whereas the lower range assumes a 50% occupancy on average over the eight months. And so uh, expected revenues would be somewhere in between this. Um, and uh, as per council direction, the, the, the intent would be for those revenues to be reinvested back into parks uh, and back into active transportation or into transportation uh, infrastructure. And so in terms of parks, that could mean the ecology center, uh, trail upgrades, bridges, boardwalks, uh, and then with active transportation that typically involves um, improvements to transit infrastructure, um, bus pads and shelters and benches as long as well as um, uh, cycling um, uh, infrastructure, bike lanes, also crosswalk upgrades, uh, et cetera. Uh, there is also the potential, uh, it's worth mentioning that this uh, parking, um, pay parking um, a pilot could be uh, expanded to other parks um, uh, uh, specifically a uh, Deep Cove uh, Panorama Park, Kate's Park, and From Mountain parking lot. So we do have a number of other facilities that, um, you know, we could uh, potentially expand this uh, pilot to. In terms of the uh, communication strategy, uh, transportation parks and communications are working uh, closely together to develop a, a strategy or a communications plan. 
uh, we will be uh, leveraging um, different uh, platforms that we have, digital platforms, um, with respect to uh, engaging the, the larger community. And then there would be a targeted um, uh, in engagement strategy for the, uh, for the local residents that would be um, you know, catered towards uh, on-street parking management and, and working through some of those uh, concerns of the, of the local um, population. Uh, and that would be again, both in and around Lynn Canyon Park and Lynn Headwaters Park. Uh, in addition to working internally, we're also working quite closely as mentioned with uh, Metro Vancouver on the uh, communications plan and just the logistics of the, of the rollout. And so in conclusion, it's recommended that the plan for the pay parking, um, a pilot project be implemented as, uh, or sorry, be uh, that the implementation be endorsed by the committee and referred to council for uh, adoption. Okay. Back to you, your worship. I'm trying to get back full screen so I can see my participants here. Uh, okay. Uh, first speaker I have is Councillor Beck. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship, and thank you, Mr. Carney, for the presentation. Um, I'll start off by saying that I will be supporting uh, the implementation of the Lynn Canyon Park uh, pay parking pilot. Um, we have had a few opportunities to discuss this as a council over the past uh, year or so. Um, and as we know, our local parks have seen a steady increase in usage over the last number of years. And since the start of the COVID pandemic, we've all seen how busy um, our local parks have become. Our parks like Link Canyon, which have drawn people from across the region. And it was interesting to see that that number of non-DNV residents is as high as 75% during the season. Um, I do believe that pay parking done on a seasonal basis will be effective at helping to manage the increased demand for parking and encouraging people to travel um, by other modes of transportation where possible. Um, I'm also really pleased that we're doing this in conjunction with Metro Vancouver's pay parking pilot for Lynn Headwaters. I think that really makes sense. And I think the communications, as much as we can coordinate the communication around both projects happening at the same time, the better. Um, I think both of the pilots will undoubtedly put some increased pressure on the available street parking in the adjacent neighborhoods. So I'm pleased that we'll be coordinating the use of some on-street parking regulations at the same time um, as the pay parking is implemented. Um, I just have a few questions. The first question uh, to you, Mr. Carney, is the report recommends a rate of $3 per hour for parking. And I'm just wondering what we've used to come up with that, that rate, if we've looked at other parks in the region or, um, or just kind of how we came about uh, with $3 an hour. Mr. Carney? Uh, yes, through your worship. Um, I can tell you that Metro Vancouver is planning on charging $2 per hour, um, but we've deliberately um, proposed a higher rate um, in order to offset the cost of the, um, of the park improvements, um, including the, uh, uh, the pay parking infrastructure. Uh, we're also looking at potentially um, incorporating advan an advanced traveler information system, so further enhancing the TDM sort of capabilities of the facility. Um, and so um, for that reason, we've, uh, we've, we're proposing the, the $3 an hour rate. And we'll, so do we have the option to, to change that rate based on demand? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's exactly right. So um, I would say that it's a, it's a, it would be a starting point um, and there's full flexibility in terms of adjusting that rate. So we're not, we're not locked in uh, to any particular rate. And I can tell you that um, City of Vancouver, what they actually do is um, target a certain um, occupancy uh, sort of block by block and they what they call um, dynamic pricing so they adjust the pricing to try and hit that occupancy rate so if it's if there's not many vehicles parked on a particular block face they'll they'll lower the rate but if it's consistently full they'll they'll increase the rate and so it's um, um, a tool that we can use as well that's great um, another one of my questions was around the annual um, parking pass for DNV residents, but you answered that uh, that cost neutral being around thirty dollars per year, um, which I think is, I think that's fairly reasonable for for district residents that do want to continue to to drive to the park or may have to drive. Um, I, I'm okay with that that number. Um, my next question is just around the. Um, uh, on-street parking regulations and how we decide which streets we're going to be looking at for for things like RPO and time-restricted uh, with resident exemption parking. 
Yeah, um, and through your worship. So the it is a it's a it's a work in process right now. So I ca I can't say definitively which streets will be which, but I can give you um, sort of a um, some insight as to how we would approach this. Um, it would be really a combination of of tools, uh, whereas. Um, close to the the park itself like so for example robinson road mm -hmm. uh, we would anticipate that being a full rpo because we know historically there's been uh, lots of issues there with a um, spillover from the parking lot into onto robinson road um, and and what it'll be is sort of a, a graduation so as you move further away from the park we would transition from an rpo call it an rpo zone mm -hmm. in uh, um, uh, time restricted with resident exemption zone um, but that zone, the call it the RE, the resident exempt uh, zone, um, where the residents can park for as long as they'd like, but visitors are restricted to certain time periods. We would we would typically go from a, a shorter time period, so a one or a two hour, um, sort of just outside the RPO zone, and then as we get further away, it may be you know three or four hours um, uh, with resident exemption. And so it's it's sort of a transition. Uh, away from the actual destination itself to best, you know, to best manage the uh, the demand. Great, thank you. Um, I guess my only other comment uh, at this point would be that the communication around this, like like anything, is going to be very important. Um, and and how we address, you know, the the broader community with with the why, you know, is going to be very important. Um, I've I've already seen sort of some negative comments posted uh, on social media, etc., about how the the main motivation or suggesting the main motivation for this pilot project might be around the new revenue opportunity, rather than really you know making it clear that the revenue is going back into the parks improvements. I think that's a point that we really need to to stress because people appreciate that, right? Um, and um, so yeah, just I think the more we can get out in front with the communications on this, the better, but um, really appreciate all the work that's gone into it so far. And, and thanks for your answers. Thank you. Councillor Back, Councillor, or sorry, Mr. Joyce, were you looking to respond as well? Sorry, I've got you uh, flagged here. No, Your Worship, I'm fine. Unless council okay. needs to ask any questions, I'm just listening in. Thank you. Uh, next up, I've got Councillor Hansen. Thank you very much, uh, Your Worship. Again, I'd like to uh, thank staff for their careful uh, preparation of the report and the uh, recommendations. I also, like Councillor Back, will be agreeing uh, and supporting these recommendations. I uh, agree with much of what Councillor Back has said, and uh, for that reason, I don't need to uh, repeat many of those points. I would say that I look forward to further discussion about applying similar kinds of demand management uh, strategies to other areas and not just to parks, but there are other areas in the district uh, which are very popular with recreational users and where people come from uh, all over uh, Metro Vancouver to uh, gain access to our uh, recreational amenities. And I think in any of these places that are becoming uh, overwhelmed with uh, uh, parking demand, we ought to consider different types of parking uh, demand uh, management. <clears throat> One question that I have, and I know uh, there was um, uh, has been suggestions whenever we talk about uh, restricting parking of any type, uh, people say, well, they've paid their taxes, so why should they have to pay again for parking? And of course, uh, embedded into this proposal is the fact that if you're a resident, you get a resident e exemption, uh, both to your uh, uh, street parking and also your uh, the, the site of the pay parking. But I wonder about this $30 charge. I wonder how much revenue that uh, really amounts to and whether that couldn't just be a free uh, uh, decal instead of something you have to pay $30 for. Perhaps for, with some of the $500,000 that we're going to achieve in revenue, we could uh, print up these decals and uh, provide them free of charge uh, to the residents. So that really would be, with that caveat, that uh, I do support the proposal, but it really would be my preference that people who have paid their taxes can use our parks without paying any additional charge, uh, including it without paying the $30 charge for the resident deck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Hansen. Councillor Meary. Um, thank you. Um, so given that this is a pilot, what happens if we don't like it after the pilot? What happens if it doesn't produce what we thought it was going to produce? Mr. Carney. 
uh, through your worship? Uh, well, you know, we ha- I mean, we have the ability to to take it out. Um, but I would say that before um, uh, coming to that decision, we could experiment with um, uh, with a d- different pr- pricing uh, strategies um, and also, you know, just through public communications. And so really, you know, the aim is is really the demand management piece of this. It's not, it's really not um, uh, the, the, the revenue from, from the pay parking. So, you know, we've been over the last couple of years, we've been, um, especially this past year, I mean, I think parks visitation is up in the order of, you know, 50 to 75%. And so we really do have to, in my, in, you know, in my opinion, um, implement certain demand management uh, tools to, to manage that, um, uh, you know, that surge in, in, in park uh, visitation. Um, but you're absolutely right. If, if we decided at the end of the pilot that for whatever reason it wasn't successful and we didn't want to continue, we, we would be you know, fully uh, able or up to council to, to uh, council the pilot. And the equipment that we're getting through the contract, the pay parking equipment, it's a two-year contract right now? It is an annual contract that can be um, ex- extended, yes. Right, okay. Um, so Lynn Headwaters, Metro Vancouver, um, did um, has been looking at pay parking and they're doing this pilot as Mr. Carney has stated in the Headwaters as well. Um, last year or this summer actually, um, they implemented also a shuttle service um, that was offered into the Headwaters and it wasn't um, very successful. Um, there was quite a low uptake on it. And um, they're experimenting around the region at Belcara and Boundary Bay, um, a reservation system, a shuttle system, and then the pay parking at the headwaters to look at different options for the regional park system. Um, the headwaters from January to October saw nearly a 20, over a 20% increase in visitors coming into the area. Um, and Metro Vancouver as a whole, it was a 60% increase, um, close to 5 million visitors coming into the regional park system by the end of October. And I haven't got the stats yet for uh, November and December. Um, so we did have a letter that came in from the Community Association today, the Lynn Valley Community Association, asking for broader consultation. And I was just wondering if Mr. Carney or Mr. Joyce could comment, given that this is a pilot, um, we're gathering information to determine how it works, what it's gonna shift, um, how movement is gonna shift into other areas, because it is gonna shift in, in a, we know that, we just don't know how much and where and, and how we're going to deal with those other areas. And given the numbers that have come in, obviously to the regional um, park system, we know that you know visitation is only gonna grow. So could you just comment on maybe it's not the right timing to go out right now in regards to, or, or the comment in regards to the community association asking us to look at broader consultation? Uh, through your worship, but can I just ask if um, um, uh, Carolyn Grafton is on the line? Our communications, um, no. Um, I can say, sorry, I, ca- I can say that uh, we are working closely with communications and so they are in the process of developing um, an engagement strategy. Um, I, don't, I don't have a lot of detail, but I know they will be relying to some degree on digital platforms such as the website and t- Twitter and these other uh, digital social media pages. Um, I think that given the experience that we, okay, so I think there's two things. You're talking about a communication strategy, Mr. Carney. I think the community association was asking for a consultation on whether parking in parks is a reasonable um, approach. So I just bring that up because they did write in, um, unfortunately, very late today. Um, but I just wanted to at least acknowledge that they had brought those concerns forward to council. Um, I think we all received the email. Um, on the communications plan, and I think Councillor Back mentioned this too, we do have to have a very um, clear communications plan. Um, we don't want to catch people off guard. Uh, we want to make sure it's clear, and we have had a couple of bumps in regards to um, getting messages out. Um, and I don't know if any, I don't think any of us want to repeat those bumps. So a clear um, communications plan. I am really no longer convinced or, um, or, uh, 
feel comfortable with the amount of social media um, that we are using to get messages out. Um, there's got to be a, a partnership with, you know, signage and just good old fashioned, um, you know, in your face um, information instead of relying on Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, I often will get um, information about district meetings two or three days after the meeting occurred on Facebook because the algorithm, um, you know, is not um, is not syncing with what I'm looking at. And I happen to be a, a number one fan of the District of North Vancouver on Facebook. So if I'm not getting it as a number one fan, um, who else isn't getting it? So I, I really hope that we use, um, you know, ways to work with the local community associations, signage um, in the area, um, working with those companies, um, you know, and, and uh, partnering with Metro Vancouver about changes as well. Um, and, you know, communicating in a broader way. A lot of us do not get the local newspapers, so that's a challenge. Um, so I, I hope we think outside of the box in that regard. I, I do think that this is um, a good test to see um, how pay parking will deal with um, the turnover and certainly encourage a, a broader turnover. Um, we are keeping the three hours at a maximum, is that correct? Three worship, yeah, that's correct. Okay, I think that's really important. And Metro Vancouver? Same, I understand. Okay. And um, I would just really, I know Councillor Hansen has piped up in regards to the free parking pass. I guess I get that there's a, a, a cost to the, the pass for DNV residents, but certainly, you know, a break even, um, you know, minimal cost as they've been paying for these parks for decades. Um, but I would like to um, support that the money be returned to the park system. Um, the impact in the park system has been you know, overwhelming. Um, it's, it's a massive impact. Uh, we can't actually, you know, Quarry Rock, I, I don't know how we continue to manage or service that going forward. The costs are so prohibitive with the amount of people that are using that trail system. And um, I, I just really, um, you know, development pays for a lot of the um, transportation um, improvements within the municipality. So I'm not in favor of the money um, leaving the park system. Um, you know, the park system needs to be supported. And I think that's why there was considerable community support once they understood that the money was going back into the park that they were visiting, not into some other fund. Um, so I, I'm not in favor of the money being um, used for transportation um, you know, other uses of transportation in other areas. It should go back into the park where the money is being generated. And Lynn Canyon has, there's massive impact to those trails in Lynn Canyon Park. Um, they're so flattened, those, those trail beds and uh, the walk down to the river, it's, it's, um, it's hard to see actually, um, you know, how much money it does need. So those are my comments. Uh, thank you very much. I've got Councillor Bond. Thank you, Mayor Little. I'll echo a lot of the comments of my colleagues here, uh, generally in support of this initiative. We have, as Councillor Back mentioned, uh, talked about this for a number of workshops over the past year or two, and so I'm glad to see this moving ahead. I am, um, I'll have two comments here. One on in the report, what I'd like to see um, from staff is a little bit more emphasis on the desired outcomes. Mr. Carney, I know you mentioned that uh, TDM, the uh, demand management, is the primary focus for the pay parking installation in this park and potentially in other parks. So I'd like to see that flushed out, uh, flushed out or, oh, sorry. I'd like to see more detail around that. What outcomes are we expecting and what outcomes are we des desiring from the implementation of, of this system? Um, how are we gonna monitor uh, those outcomes? What kind of metrics are we looking at? Uh, and you know, when I think of uh, transportation demand management, I'm thinking specifically in our parks, we're trying to manage the number of vehicles trying to access those parks. Mm -hmm. And so some metrics that I might look to to seeing that we're doing a good job is actually fewer vehicles 
uh, entering those parks at peak periods, less uh, spillover onto the local roads in the neighborhood, less conflicts around uh, that within the neighborhoods that are most impacted beside the park. More people choosing to access the park uh, via a different, uh, a different mode of transportation, whether that's by foot or by bike or using transit. So uh, in order to be effective, an effective pilot, we really need to lay those uh, goals out, lay those outcomes out, measure the impact through the pilot, and then come to a final decision to see whether or not we're being effective at meeting those goals. So I'd like to see that kind of strategy, the monitoring, the metrics, and the reporting um, going back so that council can make a good decision once this pilot is wrapping up of whether it achieved what we hoped it would achieve. So the, and I trust staff to follow through on that. You don't need to answer that question right now. So I'm hoping that's uh, gonna be a follow-up. The other thing, and I'm gonna differ from uh, some of my colleagues on this one is that I don't support uh, the resident exemption pass. Um, I think really we're talking about demand management here and that's managing vehicular access to the park. Um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily fair uh, that people from outside the district um, get charged a different rate than those inside the district, especially when the goal is demand management. Every municipality in the region has uh, regional draws. Every municipality has national draws. Lynn Canyon just happens to be one of them that's in our backyard, one of many. And so I don't think uh, people that live here should be treated any differently because it's a demand management strategy. So, um, you know, there is that are the argument, and I think we've heard this in a couple emails that uh, residents pay or have paid through the park and the park improvements and the park maintenance through their taxes and therefore uh, they should get a break on that. But I think here with this strategy and as Councillor Murray mentioned, putting this money right back into that park specifically or neighborhood improvements around the park to help manage the impact of the park um, is actually a net reduction of the amount of uh, taxpayer dollars that are being spent managing this park and investing in this park. So I don't necessarily think that's a, a valid argument once we introduce the pay parking, because the pay parking is going to offset those costs that um, residents from everywhere in the district uh, have been uh, paying for uh, since there's been no, since there's been free parking. So I don't ex support that exemption. I think it's fair to treat everyone the same that comes to the park uh, if they're choosing to park there with their vehicle. So I don't think that's going to, I don't think I'm on the side of the majority of council on that one, but I wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a couple things. Um, I concur with Councillor Murray. Um, I think I'm also a number one fan of the District of North Vancouver, and oftentimes, It'll be two or three days afterwards, all of a sudden pop, something will pop up on my Facebook that I didn't know about. And uh, when I go back and check, it may be on social media, but it isn't necessarily on the um, DNB webpage. And uh, so I, I, and also like we've said about this virtual meetings in the time of COVID, there are people that don't have computers. Um, so they're not, and, and, they may, they may have a phone, but it may not be a smartphone and they can't connect uh, and they don't want to connect a lot of them to social media. So I don't think we should rely on social media as much as we are and it'd be good to look into other methods. I'm not sure what the answer is because all of us don't get the North Shore news. So print doesn't answer it either. Um, uh, as far as the... Um, the most important thing for me is, and I'm on the side of, I support the idea here of pay parking for uh, transportation demand management, but I don't support residents having to pay for it. Um, usually, I mean, I support residents having the same timeline. They can't stay longer uh, than the maximum time, but usually, and I'm making an assumption that could be wrong, but usually it's the out of towners or the people who come farther away, they're not gonna make a quick stop and be gone in half an hour or an hour. They're usually the longer stay. Um, the residents, um, 
I think that they, I think they do deserve a break. And it's not a question of treating everybody the same. We just happen to be lucky enough to have a number of uh, um, uh, visitor sites that a lot of people and not just local people, but uh, nationally when they come across Canada and it used to be internationally, we have a number of them on the North shore. So I think that the people need to have access to that. And especially after COVID-19, on the one hand, we're encouraging people to go out and enjoy the fresh air and the trails and the forest, but we're gonna charge you if you park there. So people have lost jobs. They don't have the same kind of income. Money is a factor with them right now. And I think it's, re I don't favor it at all, but I think this is really, really poor timing to charge residents um, given COVID-19, things are not the same. We don't know how different it might be going forward. So I do think for the time being that I am not in favor of charging residents to have get their piece, their walk or their space or their piece of land to enjoy. I mean, I, I think that should come with everything else that they pay in the district. The other people, the visitors come once and they, uh, we suffered the huge numbers that came in the summer from COVID-19 and it's huge dollars and huge budget dollars to try and repair a lot of that damage. And also when the district is only equivalent to 25%, then it's not like we're losing the biggest chunk of that. We're losing 25% and I do support that going back into helping that particular park. Um, but if, if the local residents represent 25%, I think we can afford to let them enjoy their parks without charging them for it. Um, that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Forbes. Councillor Curran. Thank you um, staff and for everyone for your comments. Um, I think it's an important distinction that the charge isn't for the park, um, it's for the parking. Um, so the parks are still free for everyone to um, use. And we are trying to shift behavior and we need to be, it needs to be part of a system change where we provide, um, you know, I will keep saying this, that the most convenient and the most sustainable option, um, it, it's, Sorry, let me say, I don't keep saying it enough, obviously, because I can't get this. But what we're going for is that we want the most um, convenient option to also be the most sustainable option and the most affordable option. And that's not the way it's set up. So I think parking um, is a highly contentious issue in our, our municipality. I understand that um, in a, a car addicted society, it's hard to change behavior, but um, we have to. And this is one way that staff is recommending that we do that. And so I, I do support it. We've been talking about this for some time. Um, I like that it's um, that we have ways to experiment with um, rates during different times of day, peak activities. Um, I think there's still at a hundred and whatever parking spaces, like that doesn't really address the um, trailing, the carrying capacity for the trail network. Um, but I, I think that that's maybe a separate issue that I would actually be interested in staff speaking to because we have been talking more broadly about, you know, reservation as we see 60%, 75% increase in, in um, park visitation, which is great. We want to encourage people to get outside, but we also need to, this isn't about putting in a fee and not also taking a lot of effort on our part to make other ways to get around in our community easier um, and affordable and um, better for the environment. So I think that it's, it's something we have to work on together as a community. Um, and I, I, I certainly will be willing to do that. Um, and this has been something that we have talked about um, as staff mentioned since um, over a year ago in November. Um, and I supported it then. Um, I also would like robust data so that we actually know um, how we're doing and so that we have something to um, measure and um, I think that's gonna be really an important piece of that. So I don't know if staff could just comment on um, trail carrying capacity more generally, um, because it's, it's if you look at 2,500 vehicles a day and 125 parking spaces or whatever it is, you help me out. Uh, Mr. Joyce uh, Flagg, are you able to respond to that? 
Well, through you, Your Worship, I mean, this is a pilot program. So this is our first foray into this activity, Councillor Kerr. And um, we did speak last time in the last workshop about a reservation system. And I've been talking to Councillor Murray today about the uh, provincial parks and whether or not they will continue with that system going forward. That's something we will also look at and maybe even best suited for the next workshop we're having tonight on the trail capacity. Ms. Rogers and Mr. Mascal are on as well. We could talk a little bit about there. Um, but I, you know, we've, we've set the rates, we've set uh, uh, not the reservation system, but the, the pay parking. Um, it is a pilot and we can report back uh, after the full, full cycle and, and, and give council a really good, clear indication of what it looks like. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to um, say that I was pleased to see that the position, uh, the parking spots for people with disabilities are exempt. Um, I think that's something that we reached out to um, the community and heard feedback on, so that's great. Um, and there was one other comment that I am forgetting. Shoot, they'll probably come back to me in my sleep. Um, I'll let someone else go and if I can remember, I'll, I'll circle back. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Mr. Joyce, did you have any further comments? Your hand is still raised. Your Worship, I'll put my hand down. Thank you. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just want to clarify if some people didn't hear me correctly. I'm not referring to uh, paying to use the park. I'm referring to paying to use the parking that's attached to the park. And 25% of local residents we all have to stop playing this game that we think we're going to get uh, all the cars off the road. We're not. For whatever reasons, there are certain people that need to drive. Whether you've got a family of six, um, whether it's a, a mental, uh, mental, excuse me, a medical condition, whatever it is, there's going to be people that need to drive. And so a hundred spots uh, isn't a great deal of parking. And if 25 spots of 100, if you just, I don't know what the exact data is, but if you take 25 spots and say that's residential, I don't think we're going to make any huge waves of not trying to change things around. We have to also be reasonable and we can't talk out both sides of our mouths. We can't say on the one hand that we understand we support small businesses, we support people, it's tough financially to get through these times and then at the same time nail them for $30 to be able to go to a local park that they've been able to go to for years. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. Um, just a couple of my own comments here. Um, has this matter been referred to Pignac? Your Worship, I believe I could check on the second call, but I'm fairly clear it has been. It has been discussed at Pignac. I, Actually, I, I see Wayne's on the line. Wayne, can you can confirm that for me? Mr. Maskell? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. Susan Rogers is on the line. She okay. should be able to confirm that. She would have been involved in that. Ms. Rogers, has this been referred to Parks and Natural Environment Advisory Committee? Uh, through your worship. Uh, yes, we've taken the pay parking to uh, Piniac on several occasions as this topic has been discussed for over five years. So we've taken it to them two or three times. Most recently in the last six months or so? or Yes, and they were supportive of, of the proposal on a pilot basis. Thank you. Good fodder for a report uh, that does get referred to a committee. Uh, we do want to make sure that our committees are being engaged on these, uh, these kinds of matters. Uh, I, I seem to recall last year um, we had uh, a tremendous number of people that were showing up at uh, uh, Lynn Canyon Park and uh, transit on the weekends was, had moved to a half hour service and so you were routinely having large groups of people waiting out at Lynn Valley Road uh, to line up with the transit service. And I remember going to TransLink and trying to get them to add uh, additional service, recognizing the large crowding that was taking place. And I believe they temporarily did come in with some extra hours of service, but I'm just wondering where we're at long-term for the transit service on weekend spaces in and around Lynn Canyon Park. Uh, Your Worship, I can confirm that staff have uh, put the request forward to, uh, to TransLink. Um, to uh, look into increasing frequency to both uh, Lynn Canyon and Deep Cove were the two hotspots that 
we had identified where, you know, I think we could really benefit from improved uh, more frequent transit. And so that request has been made. Um, I can't confirm um, uh, tonight uh, what the frequency will be for 2021, um, but the, 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 uh, the request has been made. Well, if, if we're trying to push people to alternatives, we should probably confirm that the alternatives will be there. Uh, I, that was a particular problem on Sundays, I recall. Uh, we'd, we'd get large piles of people waiting out at Peters Road and Lynn Valley Road and, and uh, um, getting a little surprised that the service was so low on the weekends. Um, generally speaking, you know, I think uh, I agree largely with what my colleagues, have, uh, the issues my colleagues have raised. I think um, uh, I, I'd move a little closer to Councillor Hansen and that I think that the amount that we charge residents should be fairly nominal. Uh, intended to cover just the paperwork uh, cost of uh, addressing the issue. Um, you know, I, I, particularly while we're in a pilot stage, if it turns out that, um, that this even, you know, $3 an hour and minor charges to the residents changes behavior, then we may want to come up with something different uh, for latter stages in this kind of a process. Uh, but I, I'd be supportive of, uh, uh, you know, even a little, you know, 10 bucks, but either amount is, is fairly immaterial compared to the four to $6,000 that most residents are contributing to, uh, to the district operations. Um, so I, uh, I, I do support the, uh, the pilot going forward. I think that we should um, plan to engage with the community association over the pilot year uh, to make sure that um, uh, we aren't seeing negative spillovers into the community and that the uh, that they're satisfied with uh, uh, with the steps that we're taking to consult with the community. Um, I I appreciate you making the comments about Robinson Road. Uh, Robinson Road was a tricky little one because as soon as there was the lure that there might have been a parking spot down the space, people were turning down this tiny little space and doing tight U-turns in a very very congested spot. It would probably be best to just limit that and say there just are no uh, parking spaces. This street is RPO only. Uh, just, just for safety purposes. Uh, I, I, you know, obviously I don't want to lose public parking spaces uh, in the community, but uh, that one seemed like a safety problem when we had so many people going down that street. And similar to the 25 to 2700 block of Panorama Park, where it's just madness when you have a, a rush of people going to Quarry Rock and then people are trying to turn around uh, down at the street end on the the remote chance of being able to find one parking stall down the street. And so we saw a dramatic improvement when we put RPO for the end of the street and forced people to do the turnaround back at the end of the parking lot. So uh, that, that was, uh, I think, a good move. Uh, I, I do want to just restate that I view this as a, as a pilot, um, and I don't think that we should be proceeding on other park fronts until we are satisfied with uh, the results of the pilot. Um, I think that uh, Councillor Bond is is um, uh, talking about something very important there, which is being able to define our, our our benchmarks. What what are we seeing people do? Is the traffic demand management actually working? Are we seeing people moving uh, coming to the park more by foot and more by bike and more by by bus? And how do we measure that um, to see that the TDM is actually functioning? Um, uh, because uh, that's that's got to be the goal. I was kind of curious, and I did just have one question about it. Um, uh, in your initial presentation, Mr. Carney, you mentioned that um, uh, that it might spread out peak demand. Uh, how do you view that uh, uh, this is the TDM actually spreading out peak demand, just that there'd be lower overall numbers coming into the park, therefore less of a peak? Or do you think that, um, you know, that people will just wait until different times of the day when it's not as busy in the park. I'm just kind of curious how you think that'll translate into less of a peak. Uh, well, through, through your worship, um, uh, I, I think that with uh, the ability to implement um, the dynamic pricing, uh, we would have the flexibility to charge higher rates um, during the peak periods or, you know, to flip it around, we could offer a discount um, in, in uh, sort of the off peak periods. Um, uh, similar to, you know, how you, you know, with, say, for example, with, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, air, you know, um, uh, plane tickets where during certain, p you know, higher, highly desirable uh, windows are more expensive. Um, so we, you know, through the dynamic pricing, we do have the ability to, to, to try and manage the, the, and spread out the flow. 
and also through the um, the, the maximum uh, uh, three hour uh, stay. Um, that may help us to to um, you know create that turnover where we're, we're um, spreading out the demand over a, a, a broader period of the day. Yeah, just um, how I would use our, our regional park. So I live in Seymour. Uh, Kate's Park would be sort of our regional park over there. Um, we've certainly used the uh, um, statement: if you get in your car, you're probably going too far uh, during COVID, uh, trying to get people to recreate close to home. Uh, but as we return to our um, our regional parks, how we would use it is, is is typically after dinner hour. We would go in and kids would use the playground uh, either before or after dinner to uh, run out some energy and uh, and then come home for dinner. And, and I got to tell you that if it was a um, three dollar charge, I might not go and use the playground there. I might go and use a playground uh, closer to home. Uh, and I don't know if that's necessarily the objective you're looking for that I'd switch to a different park but uh, uh, just that's I just wanted to mention that that's sort of how we use the regional parks at our stage of life right now is uh, 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 getting the kids in there for exercise more than anything else um, yeah I, I've got uh, Councillor Curran next you're muted did it I, un I unraised my hand and I didn't unmute myself um, I just wanted to echo what you said, Mayor Little, about the importance of that transportation um, alternative. So um, really working with TransLink um, and I think getting some more information about the shuttle that didn't, but it was during pandemic. So all of the, the factors, so there's probably a lot to unpack there, but I think that is ultimately what we're trying to do is, is give people really viable, safe alternatives that are affordable um, to get um, around recognizing that some people absolutely need to drive and that's why we um, are supporting um, the spots, uh, the parking spaces for people with disabilities. Um, was there, I can't remember where we landed on, um, is, is there any incentive for electronic or electric uh, vehicles or charging? I know Metro is doing some charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. For your worship, uh, we, uh, I believe it's eight electric vehicle charging stations. At oh. Lynn Canyon or Correct. in Metro? Uh, at Lynn Canyon Park. Okay, level two? Uh, that information, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have. Are they there now? Um, uh, I, would have, I, I would have to check. I don't think so. I don't think okay. they're there now, no. Okay, um, and then the hours, we talked about seasonal hours, but is it time of day? as well as it only charged during certain times of day or that's to be determined? Um, it's, we, we are flexible on that. What we're proposing right now is essentially a, a flat rate of $3 per hour, um, seasonal for the eight months. Um, however, we do have, like I say, the flexibility to, to vary that by uh, time of day or even day of week, or even, you know, we could have a higher rate during uh, July and August, for example. Um, or a higher rate on Saturdays and Sundays and a discounted rate on um, evenings and weekdays. And so there's quite a bit of flexibility. Uh, one of the good things is that with the, uh, the kiosks, we'll be, um, uh, we'll be uh, collecting a lot of data in terms of both occupancy and, and the duration of people's visits. And so as the pilot, um, as it, um, you know, as we progress through the pilot, we're going to be getting more and more information in terms of, you know, how long people typically stay for. And so through that information, we can, you know, we can use that to design a payment structure that, you know, kind of helps to um, achieve some of these goals around um, demand management and spreading the, the park usage out over, you know, the different hours of the day and days of the week. And so, you know, it, it generally, I mean, it, the short answer is that it'll be quite flexible and we can adjust it uh, as, as we need to. So it could have an early bird special, for example. Um, <laughs> yes, or anything, kind of like golf, you know, where you can you get your twilight special or, you know, if you, if you just want to go take your dog for a, an hour's walk in the evening, you know, maybe there's a, you know, it's, maybe it's a dollar an hour for the last, uh, you know, hour of the day, but we have full flexibility to, to, to implement what we think is the right way to go there. Great. And then my last question just had to do with um, park usership data and statistics. So do we know if people if it's common for people to park hop, like to go from park to park during the day, um, or if we know they're, they're coming. I'm just wondering, like, I think that type of data would be really interesting to see if there's ways that we could be moving people from one park to another park, if that's a need. Um, if we identify that need, it, it, basically we're trying to move 
a lot of people sustainably. <laughs> so um, I think anything that we can use um, to inform that moving forward would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can add that, um, you know, what we have found is that, and this is probably, I think this is common for Lynn Canyon, Cates and, and the Deep Cove, you know, the panorama of parking lots there is that, um, old panorama park, is that the trend we're seeing is, is people are coming with, you know, large groups of people with barbecues and, and staying for, you know, eight, eight to 12 hours. So the idea with the three hour maximum is, is that we, it, it helps to improve the accessibility of the park because, it's not completely full by 10 o'clock in the morning and no chance of a free parking space becoming available uh, until the end of the day. So th th that's really the, the thinking behind the three hour maximum is to, to help with um, both the, the, the turnover and the accessibility co component. What's the current value for, uh, for parking illegally and in one of our parks? I want to jump in on that. What's the current ticket value for parking illegally in one of our parks? I'm sure Susan has that. Uh oh, did I catch everybody on this one? <laughs> I guess I haven't had a ticket in a while. Uh, Ms. I, think it, I think it's 75. Oh, Susan's just there. She's in. Go ahead, Susan. Well, she's not. She's not your worship. I think it's 75, but we'd have to confirm. I see no further speakers from council at this time. Uh, so I'm prepared to move on to the next uh, subject matter. Thank you very much staff for your presentation. Thank you for everybody participating in this matter. Your worship, could I just uh, wrap up by saying this item will be returned to council. Um, I'm hearing we need to report out a reporting structure on the metrics through the pilot. Uh, staff could revisit the resident costs for the pilot period on a per annum, have a look at that and work with TransLink on options providing service. And this report will come back to a full council meeting. And money going back into the park system. Yeah, Councillor Murray, on that, we can report on that. But that is still council's directive through the budget process. Right now, there is no money. So we'll see what we collect. Uh, that was a staff initiative that we just suggested 50 active transportation and 50 park. But at council's discretion, it all could go back into the park through the budget process if council decided that. But we could identify that that revenue goes straight into the park or system. That could be a council directive to staff, to yes. The budget. Uh, yeah, except that obviously the, the park's budget is a much bigger than what this revenue would return. So we were taking from one pocket to pay another pocket in either case. Except that the concept of having revenue generated to go back into the system was the sell to the community instead of going into general revenue. So if they know that the revenue is being earmarked, especially if we expand this process, you know, that's that's what the community, you know, was sold yeah. on, on the basis that the money would go back into the system that they were accessing. Right. But I'm, what I'm just saying is that um, the, if, if you're contemplating that the parks budget would automatically increase by the amount of uh, revenue that comes from parking that's one thing if we're just making it so that the park uh, revenue goes directly to the park's budget but it doesn't contemplate necessarily it goes increase. into the park where the revenue was generated so in this case yeah. the money would go back into Lynn canyon and i think the premise originally uh there was a condition and this goes back to the previous council of saying if we're going to ask people to come to parks to pay money to park, yeah. uh, then the money should go to parks. And I think staff has suggested that there may be some uh, transportation needs, but I think that's a, 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 a conversation for council to have after we've got some money. Yeah. But certainly I think in order to sell it from a communication standpoint, we're gonna have to say right now that this money is gonna be raised to go to parks. Uh, people are not gonna be happy to say it's gonna go to a bus stop somewhere. They, they want to that's uh, a narrative then. Uh, yep. <laughs> uh, Councillor Bond in back, I see your hands up. Is that for this item or for the next? For this item. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Bond. Just one thing, and it came up there, I think, when we were talking the three-hour time restrictions and the trend that we're seeing in the parks of people coming and, you know, bring the whole family and barbecues and staying for an extended period of time. I just want to be aware and sensitive that um, there's a there's a cultural element to that too, uh, as well in our community. And so different uh, people with different cultures and different family practices have that uh, 
that practice of getting the whole family together and going to the park for a barbecue and spending the whole day there as an important part of how their uh, family uh, works and how their family um, spends time together. So yeah, just monitoring the impact of that, because I wouldn't want to necessarily be exclusive uh, if we have a hard three hour, it doesn't necessarily apply to Lynn Canyon as much as it might to Kate's. But if we have a hard three hour maximum, then that's going to be exclusive to um, people that share those type of cultural traditions around, um, you know, family gatherings, family around food. So just want to monitor and be aware of that. And again, that's, there's no limit on them using the park for the amount of time. It's about whether cars are allowed to be parked in the regional parking lot for that time, but uh, something to monitor for sure. Uh, Councillor Back, did you have your hand up uh, for this matter or was it for the next one? I did, but I'm okay, Your Worship. We can, we can move on. Thank you very much. Okay, Council, uh, we're going to move on to the uh, next item of tonight's agenda, which is item 3.2. This is the Seymour Trail Strategic Planning uh, Session. Uh, now, typically in a uh, Council workshop, it is a workshop for Council. It's not necessarily a public hearing. We've had a tremendous amount of public um, interest in this matter. And I have five people signed up to speak. And we normally would wait until the end of the period of time uh, to include public comments. Uh, I'm proposing that we vary it and uh, get uh, these representatives in at the front end of this section. Is there any objection to that? Uh, sorry, is that support or objection, Councillor? Back? I support that idea. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go with that. And so what we'll what we'll do is actually, we'll just have the staff make the initial comment and then I'll go to the uh, five names that I have on the list here. I guess that's over to me, Your Worship. Yes, Mr. Joyce. Uh, Your Worship, tonight our Parks Department is presenting an overview of the Seymour Trail Strategic Plan, which the district intends to initiate in 2021. This is a long-term plan with the goal to provide an overarching framework for sustainable community trail plan that will balance recreational use and environmental sustainability in the Seymour area. Uh, this presentation is a little longer for staff night, about 15 to 20 minutes, but I really believe, Your Worship, it's important that Council hear this full story. It's a really important bit of work, um, and it'll give Council a really good sense of where we are. As you mentioned, there has been a lot of interest in the community. Um, I would stress at this early stage, this is really the start of the process. Reading through all the interviews or, or the emails on the weekend, there was some sense it was the end, but this is very much the start of a two-year process we're proposing. Um, so once we've had the speakers uh, speak your worship, I will be turning it over to, to Mr. Uh, Maskell to make the presentation. We'll go to the staff presentation first. So Mr. Uh, Maskell, if you wanna do your presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Wayne Maskell and I'm the Section Manager of Natural Parkland. Tonight I'll present an update on the work that the Parks Department has undertaken over the past two years towards a strategic plan for Seymour Mountain and the path forward in creating a sustainable trail network which is accessible to as many users as possible while protecting the environment in this sensitive area. The district has over 130 kilometers of inventory trails between Frome Mountain and Mount Seymour. Approximately 60 kilometers exist on Frome with another 70 on Seymour. While the trails on Frome are very concentrated, the trails on Seymour are spread out over a much larger land base, which is overseen by multiple land managers and is in a considerably more environmentally sensitive zone. On the map, both sanctioned trails indicated in green and unsanctioned trails indicated in red are shown. As you can see, the majority of the trails on Frome are sanctioned and most of the mountain bike trails are maintained under a service agreement with the North Shore Mountain Bike Association. In contrast, the vast majority of the trails on Seymour are considered unsanctioned, meaning they've never been formally adopted by the district for a host of reasons that I'll touch on throughout my presentation. Currently, no service agreements are in place for widespread trail maintenance on Seymour. Mount Seymour contains an extensive network of predominantly unsanctioned trails, which tend to draw a vast number of trail users of all types. Recreation use has steadily increased over the past decade with hiking and biking being the main activities. 
As the majority of these trails are unsanctioned, they receive only minimal amounts of maintenance and upkeep. A few authorized trails have been adopted by NSMBA trail builders who work on a volunteer basis. However, there is currently no paid trail maintenance on Seymour. Seymour is a very challenging area that it, which has made the development of a strategic trail plan somewhat difficult. There are competing land ownerships with multiple jurisdictions. The district, Metro Van, BC Parks, CMHC, and BC Hydro have a patchwork of land ownership that is further complicated by private adjacent properties, as well as district lease lands and First Nations land claims on federal lands. Many of the trails on Seymour traverse several jurisdictions which present unique challenges with respect to trail construction and maintenance agreements. Additionally, there are competing recreational uses on Seymour. Few trails are currently dedicated for individual trail use groups, and as such, there are occasionally conflicts on trails. Terrain on Seymour presents many challenges, and to date, only one all-access trail exists on Lower Seymour. The terrain and geography of Seymour is very different from that found on Frome. Whereas Frome has a fairly uniform ecosystem, Seymour has a wide variety of highly sensitive ecosystem areas that require and deserve protection before they are lost forever. There are many more creeks, streams, and wetlands, as well as older, more developed forest ecosystems that make trail planning difficult. Staff will be considering these factors very carefully in developing any strategic trail plan in this area. Due to its geography and topography, access to Seymour is not nearly as easy as Frome. With the exception of the Berkeley Hyannis and Deep Cove areas, trailheads for large portions of the trail network are not within walking or biking distance of many neighborhoods. Vehicle access is required, and while there are a few parking lots on Lower Seymour, as you move east along Indian River Road, parking is not readily available and further complicated by lease lands in the Sunshine Falls community. This community is only accessible via a private gated road. Residents of this community routinely report conflict with cyclists who are either exiting trails onto pr the private road or traveling down the road in search of trailheads. Over the past two years, the Parks Department has been taking steps towards a framework for a strategic plan for the Seymour area. This has been an ambitious, ambitious and arduous task as currently the Parks Department does not have dedicated staff resources to work on this project. All of the work that has been done to date has been completed through a combination of summer hires and existing staff working part-time. As you saw in the previous slides, the trail network on Seymour is vast with many unsanctioned trails popping up fairly frequently. As such, an accurate and up-to-date map of the trails has been a challenge for staff. In 2018 and 19, staff were assigned to the task of inventorying every trail on Seymour. Armed with GPS and laptops, two staff mapped the entire network of trails on district land and those lands that had trails that led onto district property. Mapping was only the first step, however. While on trail, staff also completed a thorough assessment of conditions from an environmental standpoint. In 2019, while completing the inventory, staff were also tasked with completing an assessment of all the built features on these trails. Stairs, bridges, walkways, and every technical trail feature was assessed and inventoried. In the spring of 2020, staff were again tasked with updating an inventory of newly constructed unauthorized trails as a result of several complaints from residents in the Sunshine Falls neighborhood. It would appear as, as if much of this new trail construction was a result of the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions, resulting in many people being home from work and seeking outdoor activities. Parks saw an increase in illegally constructed trails, not only on Seymour, but across the district throughout many of our parks. As previously mentioned, over the past two years, staff have worked hard to inventory and complete an assessment of trail conditions on Seymour. In addition to GIS mapping, staff reviewed each trail in sections with a focus on the environment. Trails were not necessarily studied from a safety and risk management perspective, but it was not completely forgotten within the scope of the project. The main study objectives over the summers of 2018 and 19 were environmental impact and sustainability. The main environmental impacts that were assessed were off-trail impacts, surface water flow and drainage, impacts to vegetation, impacts to environmentally sensitive areas, treadwear, and the use of native material versus imported material for construction and maintenance. Trails were assessed on an as-is basis to capture an accurate reflection of their current state. 
Concurrently in 2019, staff also inventoried and assessed constructed features, including technical trail features on mountain bike trails. Height, length, width, construction materials, approximate age, and structural integrity and stability were all assessed. As constructed features which are poorly built or in disrepair provide high risk to trail users, some features were recommended for removal out of an abundance of caution. Those structures were removed over the course of the next few months as staff resources allowed. With all of this information in hand, staff prepared very preliminary recommendations for each trail as a starting point. However, none have been adopted or shared publicly as the trail plan on Seymour will need to involve a significant amount of public input and discussion. Trail user, trail user groups and PENIAC would be consulted as would residents of the Sunshine Falls community. As part of the 2019 constructed feature study, a large focus was placed on technical trail features or TTFs. These are the features that are constructed on mountain bike trails and are designed to present challenge to mountain bikers. They are above and beyond structures such as ladder bridges or boardwalks, which primarily serve as a means of crossing wet areas or creeks and streams. During the assessment of these TTFs, feature condition and environmental impacts were considered. The TTFs on CMAR are in large part designed and built in place using materials from the forest floor. Very little, if any, formal engineering has gone into the design and construction of these TTFs, and often these structures are a source of considerable environmental damage. Boral pits or holes dug in the forest floor to access buildable mineral soils are often large and left open near trail boundaries. Obviously, these pits, pits damage forest floor, affecting drainage, impacting root zones of trees, and are a potential hazard if left near the edges of trails. Wood used for building is often sourced from large cedar logs on the forest floor. On a recently discovered unsanctioned trail construction project, live trees have been felled to access buildable cedar wood. These methods of construction are not sustainable, safe, or environmentally mindful. Whereas on Frome, under the Frome Mountain Sustainable Trail Use and Classification Plan, best management practices have been developed which outline acceptable construction and material sourcing methods. It is our hopes to eventually transfer these BMPs to Seymour under the strategic plan. However, as much of the construction on Seymour is currently done on unsanctioned trails, it is difficult for staff to enforce these BMPs. As with trail construction assessment, the structures assessments were completed on an as-is basis in order to gain an understanding of the current condition and the potential work required to bring structures up to the standards seen on Frome. Preliminary and very basic management recommendations were made for these structures. However, only those deemed highest risk were recommended for removal at this time. As a result of COVID lockdowns, trail use across the district soared. As such, there was a corresponding increase in illegally constructed trails and trail sections right across the district. While staff worked quickly and diligently to decommission and close these illegal trails in easy access locations, such as community parks, before they became permanent fixtures, it became evident that illegal trail building was ramping up in difficult access areas on Seymour. In spring of this year, in response to specific complaints, Staff located several newly built trails, specifically in the dark side area of Seymour. Two of these tra trails proved to be very developed, however, in very difficult to access locations. Environmental damage was significant and many mature trees had been felled to construct the trails. Staff worked diligently to inventory and assess the impact of these trails. Through their GPS inventory, staff discovered that these trails initiated on BC Parks land, traversed district land, and then exited out onto private road in Sunshine Falls. A joint decision was made with BC Parks to swiftly close these trails. A coordinated team of staff from both agencies spent several days decommissioning the two trails and making them impassable. Due to the remote nature of these trails and the difficult access, environmental restoration works by staff has proven to be extremely challenging. However, it is our hopes with the development of a strategic plan, we can incorporate some restoration works into future trail plans in this area. Armed with valuable trail inventories and assessments, park staff have developed a basic framework, which will begin to guide more fulsome planning on Seymour. The key trail values that staff will work towards are environmental protection, ecological sustainability, sustainable trail infrastructure, and multi-use access.
These are the same basic values that were adopted when the Frome plan was developed and have driven much of the trail work throughout the district. As mentioned earlier, to date, much of the work has been done by park staff on a part-time basis. However, as we are now at a critical point in the planning process, parks will be applying for a budget request to retain a dedicated staff person to move this planning project forward. It is anticipated that the next steps of this process would be completed over the next one to two years. Public consultation and data gathering will be key steps. There are many stakeholders and trail users who cannot be forgotten throughout this process. Parks would work with communications to develop an engagement process with the public. At this point, we envision surveys, trail user counts, consultation with trail user groups, and discussions with adjacent land managers will all help staff develop initial plans and recommendations for the trail network. These recommendations would then be reviewed and finalized before being presented to Council with an eye to adoption. Subject to funding and approval, additional operating budgets would be applied for for trail maintenance and upkeep on an annual basis. Staff will explore a similar maintenance model as is in place on Frome, including dedicated parks trail crews, trail maintenance contractors, volunteers, and resources from adjacent land managers on their portions of the applicable trails. As staff begin this planning initiative, we'll have a solid basis from which a framework can be built. The Fro Mountain Sustainable Trail Use and Classification Plan and the Fro Mountain Trails Environmental Assessment Documents offer valuable insights, background information, and best management practices that can be adapted to Seymour. While the ecological assessment will obviously be very different on Seymour, the guiding principles are the same. Preservation of the forest, first and foremost. While many of the BMPs developed for Frome will likely be adopted, staff recognize that some are outdated, need updating, are not applicable, or need refinement. Development of Seymour-specific BMPs will be key to this process. Obviously, staff will not develop these BMPs exclusive of additional input from key stakeholders in the community. While Frome was developed as one cohesive unit, Seymour is much more of a patchwork of land boundaries and cannot really be treated as one cohesive entity. In order to better refine the areas in which parks will focus their efforts on Seymour, staff have already developed four distinct management zones. These are Berkeley Hyannis, Central Seymour, Cove Forest, and the Dark Side. Each area has its own unique issues, both environmental and ecological, as well as different trail users. While the planning process will have an overarching goal, each of the management zones will have a slightly different recommendation tailored to its specific area, use, and collaboration with adjacent land managers, who will likely have slightly different management priorities. To date, Metrovan is the only land manager who has developed a trail plan. However, BC Parks and CMHC are currently in the very early stages of the planning process. In early January, Metro Van will be initiating a North Shore Trails Group to bring land managers together to share thoughts and ideas. Building on the management zones listed in the previous slide, park staff have prioritized these zones with respect to the approach moving forward. The order in which the zones appear on the map from west to east is how the trail recommendations will likely be implemented. The primary reason behind this decision is fairly simple, access in relation to high density neighborhoods. COVID-19 clearly illustrated that Berkeley Hyannis was, was by far one of the most popular trail use areas in the district, let alone on Seymour. Conversely, the dark side remains one of the least used area, typically only frequented by experienced mountain bikers and hardcore hikers. Access to and parking within the dark side are two key factors behind the lower user counts. Central Seymour and Cove Forest share approximately the same amount of use. As each has, and each has its own unique draws and access points. Central Seymour has Parkgate, Old Buck, and Mushroom parking lots in close proximity, while Cove Forest has fairly easy access from Deep Cove. With all four management zones, sparks, parks will endeavor to follow some main guiding principles, being multi-use trails were appropriate, all access trails were possible, provision of hiking only loops if practical, and protection of sensitive areas everywhere. Protection of sensitive areas has already allowed park staff to begin work on some quick wins in the Berkeley Hyannis area. Over the past few summers, staff have worked towards minor trail realignments, closing of excessively braided trail sections, and installation of restoration planting in heavily compacted areas. 
Staff have also set a course for the installation of riparian area exclusion fencing in some locations, physical barriers across unnecessary trails, increased plantings and better wayfinding for certain trails that as a means of keeping people out of these sensitive areas. Staff will continue with this work and pilot initial trail recommendations in the Berkeley Hyannis area first. Obviously, a trail planning exercise such as this will involve feedback from the public. Parks will work in close collaboration with our communications department to develop a strategy to best engage with the public throughout the process. At this early stage, we expect the engagement could include surveys, website content, and the use of social media like Twitter and Facebook, inviting the public to participate in shaping the direction of a strategic trail plan for Seymour. As was the Frome study, the Seymour Strategic Trails Plan will be a large undertaking with many moving parts. It will require collaborative effort from staff, the public, and adjacent landowners. It is Park's hopes to begin the next phase of this important process over the next year. Beginning in 2021, initial planning steps will be taken, a project team will be developed, and a public consultation strategy will be finalized. Throughout the year, public consultation, data gathering, analysis, and development of draft recommendations will be undertaken with the hopes of having a document outlining preliminary recommendations being ready sometime in 2022. Once final recommendations are completed, presented, and adopted by Mayor and Council, a maintenance agreement would be struck and the plan implemented in key areas, as implementation on a broad scale will have capacity issues which will need to be resolved. Staff would then monitor the plan over the next few years and make any necessary changes through an adaptive management framework. It is our hopes that over the next few years, we will be able to create a high quality, sustainable, multi-use trail network that recognizes the importance of environmental protection, is ecologically sustainable, and provides access to nature for a wide range of trail users for generations to come. I thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Mr. Maskell. Appreciate that presentation. Okay, Council, at this time, I do have uh, five speakers signed up to speak, and so we'll uh, go through them, uh, starting with Cooper Quinn, followed by Steve Jones. Uh, Cooper Quinn, can you hear me? There's now, there's been two of us that started on mute. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, um, you have three minutes to address the council. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, I'd like to say that I was planning on thinking we were going to speak at the end here so I could address kind of councillor specific uh, questions and concerns throughout there. So if you have any following if you your discussions and everything, end, please just feel free to follow up with me. Um, I want to wait till the end, Cooper. I'm, I, I can move you to the end. I will already have a Michael Kennedy joining us at the end. If you want to move to the end, that's fine. Let's do that. I love that, Mike. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, Your Worship. Jones, followed by Eric Anderson. Steve, would you like to speak at the front end or the back end? I'll, I'll go for the front end. Looks like Perfect. this might be well. But uh, thanks, thanks so much for uh, for your time this evening. Um, and uh, and uh, I found I found the previous discussion quite interesting as well. So, yeah, just a few a few quick comments on this. Um, you know, I think that this process of uh, of going through a planning process is is very important. Um, and, and I note that in the, in the report, it talks about, uh, you know, a request for a one-time budgetary allocation of $100,000 to, uh, to support a study. And I, I think that that is an important step. I do want to, um, you know, my, my participation is, is I do a lot of biking on these trails, hiking as well. Um, and, you know, one, one element that, that didn't come out in the report that I think is worth mentioning is, is the impact on local businesses. Um, you know, a mountain bike these days is over $5,000, uh, a lot of them, um, and trail and maintenance for, for mountain bikes is quite significant as well. So, and of course, everyone who's participating in the, in the activity is also stopping by the coffee shop. So there is a fair amount of, of local businesses um, that benefit from this activity in your community. I want to address three things specifically. I think that if this study is going to be successful, it's important that it's credible. And, and I really think that is that is critical. The, the report makes it sound like a number of decisions have already been made. And, and although, you know, there was some preface here that, you know, decisions haven't been made, the, you know, Mr. Mr. Maskell talked about uh, how decisions about priorities had been made. He talked about how implementation of recommendations was ongoing currently. Um, and it definitely makes it sound like, uh, like 
you know, it's, we we're almost doing a study to try and uh, try and reinforce decisions that, that were already in place. I want to address three things specifically. Um, the report talks about closing trails and, uh, you know, already trails that have been identified to be closed. And I, I think that that is not an appropriate uh, action that should be taken before a study has been performed to understand where we need trails and how many trails we need. Uh, I acknowledge that some of the trails may not be built to the appropriate standard today, but that's not a surprise since the, the maintenance agreements are not yet in place and it's, it's difficult to formally maintain those trails. Second is on environmental concerns and this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I was formerly uh, a director of Leave No Trace Canada. And we know that we can build trails that allow us to uh, engage in recreation uh, in a way that has little to no environmental impact um, if they're done right. And I, I think the, the From Mountain Best Practices has shown that as well. Uh, I'll, I'll be quite frank in that a lot of people get quite sensitive when, when environmental concerns are thrown out as a, as a reason to close trails without a lot of scientific evidence because the science is clear. Um, if, if there are concerns about the environmental impact, um, dogs, uh, to be quite frank, that are more likely to run through the swamps and in the creeks and, and defecate um, are, are a much bigger concern than uh, the mountain bikers ever would be. Um, and then third, you know, the, the report suggested that the council or that staff have, they're going to direct the, the consultant to make recommendations for specific hiking only trails. And again, it really makes me ask here, has staff already decided what's going to happen and now we're going to pay a consultant $100,000 to back staff up? Or are we actually going to look at this with an open mind? Because best practices in trail management are not to have hiking only loops. Um, what you end up with there is you end up with people have to go to the same trails all season long. Um, whereas instead, if you, if you use other ways of managing trail use, everybody in the community gets to enjoy the full diversity of trails over the course of a season. In Washington State, they have things, for example, where they'll say, this trail is a, is a, you're allowed to mountain bike on this trail, but only on Wednesdays and Fridays and Sundays. And other days, it'll be hiking only. It allows conflicts to be managed um, and, uh, and everyone still gets to enjoy the trail. You'll find that Run Wild Vancouver is actually, you know, they partner with NSNBA and Whistler. We run Whistler, partners with Warka. So collaboration between the different user groups to make sure that we have more trails and that they're accessible to everyone is the best practice and I was quite alarmed to see that recommendation and action already being taken in this in this report. Right. And I'm finally to close Steve. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then and then finally I'll just I'll just close by doing one one quick thing that uh, Mr. Maskell talked about technical trail features uh, being like a complex thing. Sometimes they are used uh, to, to add adventure to a trail, but they're also actually very importantly used very frequently to make a trail that would normally be inaccessible accessible. You can, you know, put them over a boulder or over a creek um, to make it easier for, for younger groups to, uh, to access the trail. So I, I think the work you're doing here is great. I'm very excited to see the recommendation for a plan. But if the community is going to accept it, really hope, you know, it, it starts with an open mind. Let's go get that feedback. Let's listen to the consultant. Let's not tell the consultant what to do right off the bat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my next speaker is Eric Anderson. Would you like to speak now or at the end? I'd like to speak now, uh, may I, may a little. Um, Welcome. Thank you. My name is Eric Anderson. I live at 2589 Lewis Place. Uh, I would like to uh, point out uh, a couple of things um, in connection with this um, strategic um, plan that is proposed. Um, first off, I would very much like to support the request for money for this uh, for this uh, study, because I think it's uh, it's really important that it be done. I mean, a number of reasons were mentioned already um, by staff, but I, I think uh, in view of what's been happening this year, it, it's more necessary than it ever has been to to work on this. Um, on a personal note, I would say that I prefer to have multi-use trails because I'm afraid that if we start having trails only for hikers and other trails only for bikers, then that means that people like myself who like to walk all over the place suddenly will be restricted. And it will be in the, mean the same for those people who like to, to bike and who may want to be on the maybe flatter portions of the trails. Um, I, I think, you know, 
this will be part of the discussion, I realize, but this is just my, my personal view on it. Um, I already earlier in the day had an email exchange with uh, Susan Rogers about um, our request from the Blue Ridge Community Association to be part of this study and to be considered one of the stakeholders. And I think it has always been, it has already been acknowledged by staff that that will be the case because we have so many people in Blue Ridge who use the trails, be it as mountain bikers or hikers or different ways or walking their dogs that um, for the area, specifically the Berkeley Hyannis area that was mentioned as the priority area, um, we would very much like to be at the table and have representatives from Blue Ridge to be part of the discussion specifically for, for that area and maybe also the next one over where many uh, Blue, Ridge, Blue Ridge residents are living close by as well. Now, the major point that I'd like to bring up, and, and this should be no surprise to anybody uh, tonight, uh, it was already discussed in the previous um, item, 3.1, and that is parking. Parking uh, became a nightmare when COVID started. It kind of uh, eased up a little bit um, over the summer, um, I would say maybe August, September. I don't know if maybe some people were out uh, maybe away camping, but it was a little bit easier, but um, it has come back now with a vengeance. It is unbelievable. And um, I heard, I think somebody mentioned before that it was 75% were from outside of the area. And I would venture to say that where we are in the Berkeley Hyannis area, uh, it has probably quadrupled in terms of users. And in fact, it has reached the point that when I see the weather forecast for the weekend, and if it's supposed to be good, I know it's really bad because the trails are, be, are gonna be completely overcrowded and both with all kinds of, of users. Now, it's not so much the fact that you can't really walk peacefully um, on the trails, but it's for the people uh, living close to the uh, trailheads, particularly the people on Hyannis. I just received some complaints um, sent to the Blue Ridge Community Association. Uh, so I read it on the email that we have and uh, some people were expressing their concerns about uh, the lack of respect that some, of course, a minority, but that some people uh, display when they park their cars. Uh, I understand that just as of earlier this week, or actually yesterday, or I don't know, very recently, there was a change in the parking restrictions on the top end of, uh, or the western part of, um, of uh, Hyannis. So that will address at least a couple of houses, but the complaints that I received were from um, other parts of Hyannis. So I think that has to be part of the, of the study, of the strategic plan. I know it's mentioned very briefly talking about identifying key staging and parking areas to access trails, but it, it has to be done in a way that works for everyone. Nobody says people shouldn't come and hike and, and bike on, on the trails near our neighborhood, but it just has to be in a way that is respectful for all and, and that it's done in a way that it doesn't cause the grief that it clearly uh, has and continues to, to do that now. So I would really like you to incorporate that as, as part of the plan because it is a concern. And I would like to be optimistic, but I honestly think that so many people during COVID have come to love the trails and I don't blame them because I use them myself. So how can I poo poo that? But they've come to love the trails to the extent that when COVID is over, they're not gonna go home and, and never come back. So we have to keep that in mind that this is uh, an issue. I don't want to use the word problem. I want to be, call it an issue, but it has to be addressed by, um, you know, by this plan. So thanks for starting the, the process and I'll be excited to hear as it progresses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, my next speaker is Robin Rennie. Good evening, Mayor Little and councillors. Welcome, you have three minutes to address council. Thank you. My name is Robin Rainey and I'm with the Greater Vancouver Orienteering Club. Orienteering is a sport that evolved from Swedish military exercises into a family-friendly sport for all ages, involving the ability to navigate through terrain from point to point 
using only a map and compass. Our club has about 400 members based throughout the Metro Vancouver area, and we host around 40 evening events and eight to 10 Sunday daytime events a year. Events take place in all parks around the region from Crescent Beach in Surrey to Whitecliffe Park in West Vancouver. Average attendance is around 50 to 70 people, depending on proximity of the area, weather, time of the year, etc. An event usually offers multiple courses in varying lengths to satisfy the different age classes that we offer. And consequently, all 70 people are not necessarily making use of the same trails. Evening events are usually held in urban parks and involve running on trails and around buildings um, using the features on the ground, such as trees, picnic tables, benches, soccer goalposts, etc., to navigate around the course. Sunday events are usually held in less urban areas and involve running in more wooded environments such as Sumas Mountain Park in Abbotsford or Cypress Falls in West Van. We have also organised adventure kids programs to get city kids used to ex exercising in the outdoors. Once or twice a year we host an event in the Berkeley Hyannis area of the North Shore which is one of our favourite areas because of the large expanse of forest that is well delineated with boundaries such as the golf course, the Baden Powell Trail and the power line. This gives us an opportunity to practice map reading and compass skills in a more rugged environment. These skills are becoming more necessary as more and more people are recreating in the forests of the North Shore. Having a trail network is excellent, but people still wander off trail after dogs and children, etc. And having people with the ability to manage in the forest and safely navigate their way out is becoming more and more important, especially if you've spent any time watching the North Shore Rescue documentary on the Knowledge Network. Once a year, we also host a larger event which attracts the uh, adventure racing community and provides for a five to six hour event traversing the area from Lower Lynn to Rice Lake over to Mount Seymour. This event makes use of the extensive trail network throughout the area and we have people attend this race from out of town. It is quite actually becoming an attractive draw event for our season. We've had a long relationship with the District of North Van through the permitting process, which has also involved us doing park cleanup days. And we're asking that we be involved in the consultation. Oh, your mic went off. Robin? Sorry. The something. last part, consultation, that was, oh. <laughs> Thank you. We are asking that we be involved in the consultation process, similar to the North Shore Mountain Bike Association, so that we can continue to be allowed to use these areas on Mount Seymour for our activities. We're happy to work with park rangers to identify sensitive areas and mark these on our maps as out of bounds areas or stay out of certain areas at certain times of the year. But this is one of the last areas on the North Shore that isn't excessively steep and is well suited to orienteering for all age groups. This is because we need the ability to be able to move between trails rather than just on trails to be able to do the map of kind of and forest um, orienteering that is what our sport encompasses. So we just want to be considered as part of this process. Um, anytime we hear of parks that are doing large trail work, we always feel like we're um, going to be pushed out of that area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, well, we are 45 minutes into our time for this item. We've just had the public and the staff presentation. I'm glad we did. I, I think that did uh, uh, reveal quite a bit of information. Uh, Mr. Joyce, do you have any further comment before we go to council? No, Your Worship, interested in council's comments at this point. And it'd be certainly worthwhile to get the last two speakers in this evening. Yes, uh, which we uh, hope to be able to do, but uh, time is gonna be tight too. All right, I see no further, I see no hands from council yet. Um, and so Councillor Murray, you're the first hand in, go ahead. Um, okay, thank you very much. And um, Mr. Maskell, that was a really good presentation. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, boy, it's a, it's a lot. Um, build it and they will come comes to mind. And, um, and I guess what we were building so many years ago, and I was, I, I was thinking back to when, you know, guys like, um, you know, Doug Favor and Chaz Romulus and Ashley Walker brought mountain biking from California up to North Vancouver and started Cove Bikes. And that was in 81. Um, and, uh, you know, they were like, the, the radical wild men of those mountains um, going in and, and building trails and, um, you know, 
building an industry, really. I mean, it, it did start in Little Deep Cove. Um, and, uh, you know, we're so proud of it. Um, we're so proud of what mountain biking has done for the community, for the province, for the country. I mean, it's an incredible sport. And uh, it's created businesses. It's created, um, you know, uh, a sport that allowed so many people to take part. And back then, the bikes were not the bikes of today. You know, I have a, an original Schwinn downstairs in my basement. <laughs> and uh, there weren't gears. Um, there weren't anything. Um, those, those guys rode up the mountain to ride back down. Um, there is a story um, that they rode from Deep Cove to UBC, came back, rode up Mount Seymour, skied the peaks, rode back down and kayaked up the arm in one day. That was, uh, that was the pleasure they took in the areas that we call home. And then um, Mr. Anderson will remember when the district was looking at taking this forest that we just talked about, Coven Mountain Forest, the, the lowlands of Mount Seymour, and they were planning um, a, a subdivision, a rather large subdivision um, with great big buffer zones. I remember they tried to convince me, we're gonna put buffer zones in and it'll be okay, Lisa Mary. And uh, Eric and I weren't interested in buffer zones. We were just interested with a whole bunch of other people in the cove um, and across the North Shore of keeping it a forest. And the mountain biking community was, um, I mean, Chaz paid for ads you know, the, we had petitions in every bike shop in the Lower Mainland and every hiking store. BCIT engineers, surveyors used that forest and um, they were behind us. It was an incredible time um, in the community, standing up and protecting what was important. And what was important was those slopes and that forest and the reason we all came here. Um, and then, um, you know, so it, it is, it, it's expanded over the years, obviously, to this very sophisticated um, system. And, um, uh, you know, the Schwinn bikes are no more. It's the, the complicated bikes with shocks and everything that I don't understand about riding downhill. Um, but it's, uh, it's something that we um, need to continue to um, finesse. It's something that we need to continue to support. Um, but we always need to remember that the environmental integrity of that mountain needs to be the priority um, for everybody to use it. And um, uh, that's what I always have to keep in the back of my mind is that without the, the, the integrity and the preservation of that forest, none of us get to use it. And the reason you go into that forest is to bathe in it. To, to, to be one with nature and to really feel what it has to offer and to get out of this rat race that we're living in and this, this time of great stress, you walk into that forest and you, you are, it's a, it, it, it changes everything. Um, in this report, we talk about this one area of the lower slopes of Seymour and and I and in the in the many letters and boy, there's so many people and I look at so many of the names that were coming in and so many of those people are actually the kids and the nephews of people that I went to school with, and um, they're so you know they're so eager to um, increase the opportunities um, for their sport. Um, and the, the thing that they love to do, it's like you grow up and, you know, you grow up in the cove and you learn how to ski on Seymour and then you get a little bit better and you might move over to Grouse and then, you know, the Whistler is Cyprus and then you go to Whistler and you're, you're always trying to find, um, you know, more vertical, something more challenging. And um, so when I look at this report, and, and which I'm totally supportive of, um, and yes, we absolutely need to encompass all of the users into this discussion. And we need to listen to those that are on that mountain, whether they are mountain bike riders or hikers or um, orienteers or runners. Um, there's horses in those trails, trails as well. There's all sorts of different things that we need to try to encompass into this plan. But I don't look at it as just North Van. And I think that that's 
um, what we need to going forward really consider. We need to, and a lot of the letters included, you know, we need to look at the North Shore and that's what we have to do. We have to spread the love for all of these trails across the North Shore. We also have to recognize that we can't be everything to everyone forever. Um, you know, but I, I, I don't think that we're looking at this broadly enough. Um, I, I, I want to, um, and I know that uh, Mr. Joyce mentioned this, that I, I have reached out as a member of the Parks Committee for Metro. I reached out to Metro Vancouver. I reached out to our Parks Department um, and Mr. Joyce to sit down with those land users, including the CMHC and the Provincial Park System. And I have to say, Mary Little, the park system, the provincial park system is woefully underfunded with planning staff and resources to be able to do this. I mean, they, there's like a planner for the whole southern region of the province. It's just, it's, it's insane. And these parks are being just, you know, um, inundated with people wanting to get outside, certainly through this pandemic. Um, so I want to look at this area, but we also need to look at the entire North Shore. We need to talk to West Vancouver. Um, we need to talk to the mountain operators and see what opportunities exist within those um, boundaries for opportunities for, um, you know, m mountain biking. Um, and certainly in the letters that we received, there was a lot of, I think, young energy wanting to have bigger jumps, higher jumps, um, more technical jumps, and, and where can that go? Um, I mean, you know, we, we know what goes on at Whistler. We have three local mountains in our backyard. What kind of opportunities exist there? So I think this is a, a good first start. I think we need to bring more of those landowners and those operators together at the table to start talking about some of these opportunities. Um, and we absolutely need to provide more resources to our parks department to do this work. Um, the impact to the local neighborhoods, um, absolutely, it needs to be addressed. And I just go back to what happened when, you know, we were looking, when we were, the, the trails were being built on Fromm and what happened with the neighborhoods there. And we implemented resident only parking. It's not rocket science. We know how it goes. Um, and that is what's going to, uh, you know, move over into the eastern part of the district uh, with the expansion and the use of these areas. But we all are in this together. We all, um, we all love these trails. We all love these communities and our neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, we all need to sit at the table and figure this out. Thank you for the, the amount of time you gave me, Mayor Little. Thank you, Councillor Murray. I know it's uh, near and dear to your heart. You know, when we talk in heritage circles, we would, when you would come upon this great example of a heritage house, we would say you're you're walking on holy ground here. You should take your shoes off and and recognize it. And and uh, I think anytime we have these discussions, we should be recognizing and honoring the groups that protected these lands uh, for the use of uh, the residents, not just of the district, but the residents of of the Lower Mainland uh, for a recreational space. And and these were uh, many of these lands were targeted for redevelopment at the time. And uh, I'm so glad that people stood up and fought and uh, retained those lands for uh, uh, wilderness and for public use. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have Councillor Kern. Thank you. Um, thanks to staff for the report. I thought that was really um, helpful to sort of frame. Um, I'm just going to turn my hand off because it's distracting. <laughs> um, keep my mute. Keep my mic on. Turn my hand off. Um, so I, I do want to acknowledge and, and ask staff to comment on um, the working, uh, working with uh, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish um, and potentially Musqueam as well on that because that hasn't come up yet. So I think that's important. Um, should I go, go through all my questions or does staff want to comment on that outreach? Mr. Joyce, can you respond? Uh, just through you, Worship, we, you know, we will develop in terms of reference what we will do, but that will absolutely be part of that outreach we will be talking, as we do with TWN and Cates Park and, and Squamish. So yes, uh, the two First Nations will be consulted. Thank you. Um, I think that's really important. Um, the, I try to view policy through a planetary health framework, which means that um, the, the environment is, is central to 
um, the decisions that we make because we rely on it for human health. So um, I think that that is really important um, and using evidence, um, good evidence and data is going to be important. So I'm, I, I actually am looking forward to seeing the report. It looks like there's already been um, an assessment done. Is that correct? From Wayne's report, it looks like we've already done the inventory of the health of all of the ecosystems, et cetera. Your Worship. Yes, we have done a, a assessments, environmental assessment of the, the actual trails and the portions just off of the trails. We haven't looked at the whole forest and done an assessment of the entire forest ecosystems, but that will be something that we'd want to look at with our consul with our consultant. Yeah, I, I just think that's really important because we all we something we have in common is we all uh, well we all need oxygen. Um, but we all love the forests um, and we have to find a way to um, work together um, to um, really steward them um, sustainably. So I, I really do want to um, have everyone and looking to the North Shore Mountain Bike Association um, who has a lot of folks um, in the biking space and then any groups that work with hikers, like trying to really work, engage obviously with all of the different um, user groups um, to find ways to work together because I think we are faced with limited infrastructure. Um, we're in a climate and ecological emergency. We um, need to really be thinking about cumulative and life cycle impacts of things. So I do think, uh, I think back to the days when I was working on single use plastics and, you know, the, the old meme about like, what difference does my bag make says 7 billion plastic bags. And so I think it is sometimes with trails that it's, Everyone thinks that what they're doing isn't having an impact, but it's the cumulative impact of that that we need to um, really educate the community about um, because I think that is really important. So um, I, I would say that there is no such thing as no impact. Um, there's going to be impact from humans, but there's lots of health, um, mental and physical health benefits to being in the forest. So we need to find a way um, to do that in the best way that we can. And I, I do think we're to the point in, in Seymour in particular, it is so complex as staff has pointed out. Um, I was looking for archetypes from other places because we have sometimes people saying, why can't you be more like X, Y, or this other place? And I'm like, we're unique in that we're a region of two and a half million people. Um, and that makes us different than um, some other mountain biking um, communities that aren't um, assessed by that many um, folks at a time. So I think that is something we're gonna have to work towards. Um, the limits of acceptable change. Oh no, it appears we've lost Councillor Curran. Uh, we'll come back to Councillor Curran in just a minute. Uh, Councillor Back. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, hopefully Councillor Curran's not actually frozen there. She will come <laughs> back. <laughs> um, Good evening, everybody, again, and uh, thank you very much, staff, for all the work that you've uh, put into, into this uh, and starting this conversation tonight, which is really the first step in creating a plan for the Seymour Trails. And uh, lots of great points have been made already. I agree with a lot of what Councillor Murray said, and with, just with regards to our community being the birth of, of the sport of mountain biking and, um, and really these trails being a real defining characteristic of our community in so many ways. Um, so I note that we have received a lot of attention, particularly from the mountain bike community with, I think at my last count over hundred emails uh, on this topic in the last few days. Um, one of the themes I think I've heard, and I think is going to be really key to the success of any plan is collaboration. Um, you know, we know that ensuring the, um, we know as highlighted in the report that the district is only one of the land managers and working with BC Parks and CMHC and Metro is going to be key to making this plan possible and as seamless as possible when you're out there and building the, making the best trail network that we can. Um, I'll just make a, a, a number of points here. With regards to the NSMBA as an organization, I will say, as I've said before, I believe we have a true partner um, and I think that they deliver significant value to our residents by building and maintaining this trail network um, that for many, for many of us is part of our daily lives. And I believe rep they represent far more than just the mountain bike community. And I, I think the work that they do goes far beyond the staff resources that we have available. And uh, the Frome Trail Maintenance Agreement is a model that we could potentially use uh, when we look at, at Seymour. Um, one of the other themes that we heard in um, 
the mountain bike community in particular is that they want to see more trails, a greater variety of trails. Um, and I think that's something that, that we should, we should be considering, um, you know, in a, if this is the birthplace of the sport in so many ways, um, we've done little as been highlighted in a number of comments, uh, from, from people in the mountain bike community, we've done a little in the way of building um, new trails in the last 20 or so years. And the sport has changed, the style of riding has changed and we haven't necessarily evolved with it. So I think there's an opportunity there um, with regards to the types of trails that we have and could look at having in the future. Um, also as Councillor Curran had, had alluded to, but I, I think when we are um, looking at sustainable trail design, and trail maintenance programs, we can be looking to other communities, um, recognizing that we are unique and that we, we live in a big, um, a very big city or adjacent to a very big city and region. Um, but we can look at other places to see some of the best practices and things that they've done. And uh, there was a number of places that were highlighted in the emails uh, that we received. Um, I guess just a final comment right now, and then maybe I'll, I'll have more later, but while the mountain bike community is really the most identifiable and they're the, or, the most organized of the various user groups, I think it's really important, as has been highlighted already, that we actively reach out and connect with the wide range of users of our trail systems. Um, we heard Miss Rennie tonight from the Vancouver Orienteering Club, and uh, of course we want to speak to the hiking community, the trail running and ultra running community, which is huge on the North Shore. Um, and to those families, those people with physical challenges that use our trails, as well as um, in, in including our community associations, as uh, Mr. Anderson has pointed out here tonight, uh, that are in this area. Being inclusive, I think, in this process is going to be very important to making sure that we have the right people at the table representing all of these different um, user groups. And I think that's an important part of, of building this plan. But that's just sort of my initial comment. Thank you very much, Councillor Back. Councillor Curran, I understand you've rejoined us. Uh... That's, that is the first time I have like my, com my computer completely crashed. <laughs> like it wasn't Zoom, it was like my entire computer. And then I'm like, anyway, so um, sorry, I, who did I miss? I think Jordan was talking, did yes, someone only, else? Only Jordan. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I think just echoing what it seems like we're all talking about is that we want to have a broad range of people involved um, in the process and um, that we're trying to look at long-term um, planning. I think the health, understanding the health of the forest um, to the entire community will be really helpful because I think it's something we all care deeply about. So I think that we will all come together to um, work on that um, together. And um, so I, I look forward to that. And um, yeah, I'll just, I'll let everyone else uh, go. And uh, I'm sure if I have something else to say. Oh, I, let me just finish with the looking at other places um, I agree. There's stuff to learn from. I actually had reached out to a couple of counselors in other places that do have um, mountainous areas in their um, communities to try to look for um, ways, things that are working. And I know staff is doing that as well, but it's always helpful um, to hear, but also just to recognize um, what makes us unique and um, trying to trying to find, it's a very, like, I don't think we can underestimate the complexity of this challenge that we have, um, but I hope that we can all work together um, to, to come up with what we think is the best, um, most sustainable way to move forward. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Next up is Councillor Bond. Wow, where to start? Um, uh, I wanted to thank Councillor Mary for that great um, background. Uh, it's um, important and valuable to understand the history, and there's a lot of history uh, when it comes to mountain biking on the North Shore. And I'll make a few a few points here. And uh, Miss Rogers will probably, uh, this will probably be, uh, sound like a broken record as uh, we've had conversations uh, for a long time about this topic, both while I uh, have been on council and, and previously. Um, I think mountain biking is uh, a core part of so much of what our community has here is in North Van and on the North Shore. Just reading through, I think it's, it's up to 189 emails over the past couple of days now, uh, reading how important the trail network uh, is to people, how many people have chosen to move here and build a life here and raise a family here because of the trail network, because of that access to the outdoors. 
So this is a really important topic. It's uh, at least by email count uh, about as, top, as important as Christmas lights uh, at this point in time. So uh, how we go about this process of divine decide, uh, defining a plan for this trail network long-term on Seymour is really important. Um, one one criticism I had uh, of the, the Frome plan um, is that it wasn't necessarily in my mind a, a trail plan it was always a trail use and classification study and um i think like uh, some of the i think um uh, steve jones mentioned going into this planning process with our mind open it is very important i think it's important to hear from the users and then design the plan around um around user experience and you know i might uh, i might be out on a limb here um in saying that um i think that user experience and, and the need for people to get outside and recreate especially in this interface area where we've got a huge region uh, a busy and a growing region right butting up against a a, a natural forest area that there there's a balance that needs to be made between user recreation and environmental protection um, and when i hear um, preservation uh, you know preservation and conservation and management all have different meanings to different people but i want to be really open in looking at how this area uh, can not only be uh, preserved uh, for a long term but really preserved for, to allow people to recreate and use these trails because there is so many benefits that come out of uh, trail use and people being out in the forest using the trails, uh, exercise, health benefits, uh, and we're seeing a lot of that right now. Um, you know, another thing, uh, just you know, going back a long time, the I think it was the um, is it the Perk report when uh, Rec, uh, the Rec the Recom did their analysis a long time ago about recreation facilities, trails are and have been and still are the number one desired and used form of a recreation facility here in the district and for to have um that type of recreational that type of municipal infrastructure how many other types of recreational infrastructure of municipal infrastructure do you literally have people begging to build it and maintain it for you for almost next to nothing and I think it's it's a unique uh, thing. And, you know, I'd also think um, Councillor Christ, uh, you know, we, we say that the mountain bike community is one of the most organized and um, vocal communities here on the North Shore. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that they were threatened and the trails were threatened. And the, um, you know, it might not have been uh, his desired outcome. I'm not sure what it was, but um, you know, having 400 people show up at District Hall when uh, mountain biking is planned to be banned really forced the community, uh, unlike hikers or, or trail runners or other trail users, to become organized and become advocates. So I think there's a, there's a lot of work here and, and similar, you know, all the background work. These are This is the important work that staff have been doing, like they did through the ARSS process on Frome and the trail classification plan on Frome. These are the background, the professional work that helps council and the community make proper management decisions about these trail networks. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, looking forward, I'd really like to hear more about how the public engagement process is gonna look. Um, you know, we talk about Seymour, um, I'd actually say Seymour has more access uh, compared to from there's lots of comparisons we can make to existing process but i think going into this one i'd like to see it a little bit more open-minded than at least my perception of the from process was uh, looking at providing uh, more opportunities for recreation in the seymour area um, looking at a long-term plan that's not just classifying trails and decommissioning or upgrading but that's actually a trail development plan um, that includes multiple points of access Seymour, you can drive to the top. It's different than from. You can access it from four or five different places from along the bottom and the sides. Uh, and so there's there's a lot of improvements that can be made just on access and co connectivity. Um, engaging people is gonna be really important here. Um, you know, my, my in my history of uh, being on the other side of the uh, equation where Cooper is now, people are very passionate about 
um, about the trails, about their individual little favorite section of trail. And so reaching out to people and really having people involved in the plan and co-creating this plan with us, I think is very important. Um, I'll stop there. I think, you know, this is going to be a, a multi-year process and council will have opportunities to provide comments and direction going forward, but going in, I'd be going into this with an open mind and really uh, hearing what people's desires and aspirations are for the trail network moving forward. Thank you, Councillor Bond. I think uh, former Councillor Christ's uh, uh, shot across the bow as he wanted cycling to only occur on hard surfaces. And uh, so it was a direct shot at uh, mountain biking. Uh, or somewhere up Indian Arm, I think, too, right? <laughs> It's certainly a rallying cry for uh, for that community. Uh, Councillor Hanson, you're next up. Thank you very much, Your Worship. And uh, thanks to Mr. Maskell and to staff uh, for the very uh, detailed report and to the speakers who have already spoken and, uh, and hopefully who we'll get to, uh, we'll hear before the end of the night. I'm not going to repeat a lot of what's been said by the other council members, uh, a lot of good points. I obviously uh, agree with those points. I did want to provide just a little bit of response to the volume of emails that uh, we've received. And I, I start by observing uh, that, as has been stated, we're at the beginning of a process, uh, not the end. A lot of the emails had very detailed uh, commentary about uh, where they wished um, uh, this process to lead and uh, all I would say is that uh, what we're doing now isn't finalizing our Seymour Trail Plan uh, but beginning a process that will uh, allow us to come up with a Seymour uh, Trail Plan and for my part um, uh, uh, let uh, all interested parties uh, be rest assured that I very much favor a full collaboration uh, full collaboration with all the different uh, jurisdictions and landowners, but also full collaboration with all the stakeholders. Uh, yes, uh, full collaboration with the mountain bikers. I'm very interested in meeting their needs, but there are also the other user groups. Uh, and for my part, I think our goal is to find win-wins, find solutions whereby all the different user groups feel that their needs are, are met. I do support the investment of $100,000 uh, to begin this uh, process of the study. I will say that over uh, uh, over all my uh, uh, observations on this, uh, environmental protection has to be the top priority. But beyond that, I believe that with careful analysis, uh, with detailed uh, and appropriate public engagement um, uh, from the different user groups and jurisdictions and landowners, I do think we can find solutions that, would, that will work for everybody. I thank everyone for their input. And uh, I look forward to a great plan that uh, meets meets the needs of the users of these trails, of, of which I am one, I can say. I'm a daily user, uh, not on a bike, uh, but on foot of the trails around Hyannis. And I can certainly relate uh, to the commentary of how much passion people have for these trails because they are uh, a beautiful treasure of our district and of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Just a follow-up comment, Councillor Mary. Yeah, I just wanted to, um reach out to um, uh, Cooper Quinn of um, M NSMBA and, and um, you know, implore, I know when we were having challenges up and from when the, you know, NSMBA was being created and we were, you know, we were having all of those challenges. I'd forgotten about Councillor Chris's uh, uh, little motion. He had motions for everything, the most motions of any councillor in the entire country. Um, is uh, he's he owns that fame, um, and um, a series of lawyers actually wrote a paper on it. Um, anyway, uh, so um, you know the NSMBA council when we were working in the early days, you know we were we were asking for that communication with users about you know best practices when you're going into a neighborhood and when you're parking and when you're, you know, accessing the trail systems from these neighborhoods. And, and I think Mr. Anderson, you know, it's certainly the minority, hopefully, but I have to say that, um, you know, we want to be able to um, use our staff to be working on this, um, this proposal or this, this, this process and lending their energy to that instead of having to deal with, um, you know, illegally built trails or, you know, one's decommissioned and another one opens up. And I know there's a frustration because of the 
you know, the ability for people to want to improve. Um, I was devastated knowing that somebody went in and clear cut a part of the forest out by sunshine. Um, and we need to be able to use, the, to use any opportunity available to be able to get out to the mountain biking community to say that we're not we're not condoning that kind of behavior. You, you can't go into areas on private land and cut down swaths of trees and ultimately impact downhill um, residences, um, create opportunities of, you know, for erosion and water. We have so many issues with these intense water systems coming into the district that we have never had before. And it's, it's creating these hazardous, hazardous areas for everybody mountain bikers, hikers, residences, people, you know, driving out on those roads. So I, I just reach out to the mountain bike community, to the hiking community, to everybody that is using those areas to, you know, they're, they're, we, we have, um, you know, we want to be able to protect that area for everybody. And um, if we see something that's happening, we need to make sure it doesn't happen. We need to step up and we need to, we need to make sure that people are behaving appropriately and not taking things into their own hands. Um, you know, and I, and I, and I'm, I know that that group's small, um, but it's not okay. It's absolutely not okay. And we want, you know, I want this partnership to evolve. I want this partnership to grow because the work that um, our volunteers have put into the trails over the years have been exceptional. And um, it's, it's created these world-class mountain biking trails, hiking trails, running trails. It absolutely has. And we need to actually encourage other groups to step up too and take responsibility for these, um, for these trails. I know, um, you know, the Nidakras at one time were a very involved um, group. Um, you know, it was, um, you know, the trails were evolving in those years. Um, but I think we have to put together, Mr. Joyce, some sort of an, a, a way for all of us to take part. I've built trails for hiking before. I built the stairs down on Riverside up to Carnation. You know, it's a great way to get involved and it's kind of fun and you get muddy and it's good. Um, but we have to expand those users. And Eric, maybe there's something you can do with the community. You know, we should reach out to the community associations as well and get the neighbors that are going into those trails to organize um, trail working for those trails that are used predominantly by hikers and the, the Vancouver orientation you know there's work that you you are volunteering and you are doing work and so we all have to do this together um, and protect those trails but you know that clear cut pissed me off really upset me and I think it upset that community and I think it should upset all of us that there are people out there that think they can go in with chainsaws and fell trees in a on a hill um, anywhere. I, I just I don't understand that. I just I don't I, I don't dig any of that. So um, I just reach out to all of the user groups to say let's um, let's protect what we all love. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mary. Well said, Councillor Hansen. Thank you is that an errant hand? Yes. Thank you, but uh, I'm I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I won't take up much time because a lot of points that I was going to make have been thrown in somewhere or another in, in others' comments. And I wanna make sure that the last speakers have time to uh, say what they want to say. I just have a couple of things. Um, I think, of course, the accountant in me says that I think the district really needs to sit down and also have a plan for how we're going to fund capital and maintenance type issues. I don't know that we've done that specifically, uh, taking on some of that ourselves. We've had the NSMBA help and leverage for volunteer work, but I think the district actually needs to look at it because I think this is a bigger issue than... Um, it's become a much bigger issue, especially after COVID-19. So I'm gonna be looking for us to sort of review how we work some things into the budget. Um, I also wanted to say that um, we've learned lessons from Frome and there's still a lot of unauthorized building going on on Frome. And I'm not quite sure, I sort of understand, but I really don't understand why we all can't 
work together to get a solution that is a win-win on both sides. Um, and it seems to be that there's sort of a smaller group that has um, kind of either a lack of understanding or um, um, a sense that um, public land is their land and they can do what they want on it. And as Councillor Mary just said, I'm not kosher with that either. Um, so uh, I also want to take a bigger view of, of what's going on because I think not only spreading it over the North Shore and coming up with a plan that's not a plan here and a plan there, but more of a cohesive plan um, is essential in order to stop these unauthorized building uh, trails that are going on. For instance, on Frome right now, there's a brand new unauthorized uh, trail called DT and it's a double diamond and they've been building that for a while and it's advertised on trail forks and it's unauthorized and so what does the district do about that? I need, I think there needs to be a discussion around that end of it too. Um, sort of, you know, if, if people do start cutting down trees and causing flooding and er erosion problems, um, what, what do we do about that? What's our role in that? There needs to be a discussion on that as well. Um, uh, the trails are for everyone. And so there has to be, um, population is growing and COVID pointed out that the North Shore is the ideal place to come for a lot of people to be outdoors and enjoy that. So we really have to sit down and realize, I think it's already been said, that we can't be everything to everybody, but how can we be the most we can be to the most amount of people? Um, and that's not only the, the bikers, it's all active users of, of our forest. I mean, we put in the, um, uh, we have that urban boundary to try and protect the forest, which is essentially also where we hope the bears would stay. And now maybe the trails are encroaching into the forest, which is modifying and changing what the bears are doing or where they're going. So for every action, there's a reaction. And I think we have to think about that. If we want to be environmentally sensitive to some of the areas in the forest, as well as the animals, then we have to take all of that into consideration. So I'd like to take that big uh, picture. The other, one other thing, I, I mean, I've got a bunch I could mention, but there's another thing here that I would just like to mention is that before we start, or not before, but as we start down, which I think starting a proper planning for Seymour is an is excellent idea. Um, and having as much um, uh, stakeholder input is an excellent idea. But as I said, we've learned lessons on Frome. And so I, at the same time, would like to see us, we're gonna be working through things on Seymour, We've already worked through things on Frome. Frome's is a little older and maybe needs a, a look at with some of the things that are happening on Frome. And so I'd like to kind of do it at the same time. Uh, take a revamp of what's on Frome, take the lessons we learn, uh, change things if things need changing and use that towards uh, what's being the strategic plan is for Seymour. Um, and the... Um, uh, the other thing about that is we haven't had enough staff to do what we needed to do on Frome. There have been lots of issues and lots of things come up and we just simply don't have the resources and the staff to deal with a plan on Frome. And now we're moving to another plan on Seymour. So we really have to look at either getting enough staff, putting a proper budget behind it to be able to accomplish things or we shouldn't try fooling ourselves that we are working this out because we're not working it out. We need to come together and try and work it out so that there's no more of this malicious uh, um, damage that's going on in the forest. Um, it's just, it's really upsetting and, and, and the environment should come first, absolutely first. Um, because we wouldn't have those trails and we wouldn't be able to get peace of mind if we don't take care of them. So my biggest thing is I would really like to see that we learn lessons from Frome and work together with what we can with Frome and Seymour at the same time and put a proper staffing behind it and proper budget behind it. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you very much, Councillor Forbes. Uh, just for my own comments, um, I agree with much of what Council has said. Um, I, uh, I do get concerned about the impression being given that uh, some elements are a fait accompli, uh, that uh, I, I do want to be uh, open to feedback from all sources. And, um, but I, I also, the pushback is um, the community needs to recognize that the environment needs to come first. And that doesn't mean that we can't have a robust mountain biking uh, trail network on the North Shore. It just means that there are going to be times when Mr. Maskell comes to the community and has to say, I need to close this because of environmental damage. And we, need to, we really need to be supported by the leaders of the community uh, to make those changes if it's uh, justifiable. And we have had uh, situations where um, uh, little portions of trail uh, have needed to be um, uh, closed and it's caused a big uproar within the community. And uh, so while I am open and um, uh, do want to see a very healthy uh, mountain biking community in North Vancouver, uh, I, I do recognize that there are going to be times that we need to respond to environmental erosion uh, issues uh, and uh, also issues where water courses are being diverted. One of the big challenges along that dark side portion is that uh, some of the creeks that used to get a small amount of uh, the distributed rainfall in that area are now getting uh, a very large portion of it. It's all coming across the ridge and coming down. Uh, and some of, that, some of that is happening naturally and some of that is happening because homeowners have rerouted uh, different little water courses and spaces. Um, and some of it is going to be because our, of erosion from recreational activity. And so we just have to recognize that it does have an impact. Uh, it's sometimes it's a worthwhile impact and sometimes it's not. And, uh, and that the district is going to have to work with the community to put li reasonable limits in those places. But I do wanna make sure that it's not viewed as a fait accompli in the, in the municipality. We, we're at a very early stage here. This is going to be a long-term project as many members of council have said. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we're starting off on the right track. I see no further speakers from council. So I think at this time, I'm gonna go back to our speakers list. Uh, Cooper, you've had the benefit of the whole evening's discussion. Uh, the floor is yours. You have three minutes to address council and somehow encapsulate all of your views on mountain biking in three minutes. There's a lot here, hold on. Uh, um, oh, you, you're doing double duty tonight. That's great. <laughs> yes, <laughs> triple duty with the uh, palliative dog care behind me as well. Um, so I'll just bang through this really quickly. I kind of took some notes as we were going there and then I'll send this to you guys as well so that you've got it in writing as well. But to start, as stated in our letter, um, we support this process wholeheartedly. Um, the presentation given by Mr. Pascal was outlines many of the challenges as well. And uh, we think that this report will hopefully address a lot of those challenges. We're involved in three processes that are similar to this across uh, various other parts of Seymour at this time, going at various different speeds of various different governments. Um, we absolutely support ecological and environmental conservation. That's number one for us as well. Um, we do believe that the most effective way to do this is management, not just trails management, but people's man management. And the trails don't cause environmental damage, trail users cause tra environmental damage. And each trail out there, whether sanctioned or not, represents the desires and needs of some portion of the community of trail users, whether it's an orienteering path, a hiking path between communities or to a mountain or a purpose-built double black mountain bike trail. And we need to listen and understand why certain trails exist, who is using them and why. And um, a couple of specific comments in no particular order, kind of as they came in from counselors. Um, ultimately the trails are important to all of us. We wanna make sure that all trail users have a part and hand in this process. Um, you know, we see the passion that people put into construction, maintenance, and um, recently emails. Um, and the mountain bike community really is emailing in mass because there's a frustration felt in the community with continued trail closures um, and the seeming inability to build new trails and new progressive trails. And really progressive trails can mean anything from jumps for 10 year olds um, above Blue Ridge to learn on or jumps that only a small percentage of riders have the ability to use. But um, ultimately we all have the ability to aspire to use them. And, I'd like to make sure we listen to what the community is saying and asking for here through this process. Parking is absolutely a challenge, something that we can address with additional trail and network planning. Um, we can overcome this. I think trailhead amenities are a big factor there. Um, and carrying capacity and uh, limits of acceptable change frameworks are very important and part of why we need to be going through this process because management and maintenance ensure trails are sustainable. Um, and 
realistic management frameworks that the community can buy into and not have you know be thrust upon them, whether perceived or real, um, will have the most likelihood of success. Um, and many of those trails off the first switchback, as you just mentioned, may a little um, have been there for decades. And they're valuable assets, and we do have to make trade-offs, and communication is going to be a key part of all that. Um, the multi-use trails for the DIV is really reporting, and like, realistically, there is some environmental impact, but is the recreational impact? So it doesn't outweigh that. And um, 2020 trail stats show that trail ridership is increasing and it's increasingly local. So usership is up, but it's more local than ever. Um, according to trail folks, it's approximately, trail forks is approximately 75% local on Seymour this year. Um, and I'll keep it fairly short there. I would like to say on a personal note that frankly, the behavior of some of the residents of Indian River Drive, well, I can't say that they're residents, motorists on Indian River Drive has been appalling. I was nearly run off the road on my road bike. Um, and that's an, a conflict that I think we really need to focus on and figure out what we do there because that is also used by road bikers. Um, and with my NSMBA hack back on, we're here to help and we're here to help maintain trails. And importantly, I think here, we're here to help you understand what our community wants and needs and how we can communicate with them, how we can make trade-offs, make compromises and make the environment in our community safer and better uh, for everybody. And big thank you to Wayne and to Gavin for what was, I'm sure, a massive amount of work preparing for this. And it's going to be an even more massive amount of work as we go through this process. I can think of no better way to finish this than to see our, our next mountain biker there. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to Oh, wow. Really little. Holy oh, it's God. a brand new one. Congratulations. <laughs> He's 20 three days old now. Wow. Oh my. So he's a couple days before he's going to be on a bike. That's great. <laughs> Congratulations. It's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so with that, I will, uh, I will hand it off. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, Your Worship. A future friend for Henry there, uh, their counselor back. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> All right, well, um, Council, I think we've had a really good discussion about this tonight. Um, I, I know that this is the start of a long process, um, and so there will be many opportunities for Council and community input into this process. Uh, I just want to thank uh, the staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Maskell, for your part, and also for the members of the public that participated. Thank you all very much, and I think uh, this may be our last uh, meeting before uh, before Christmas for most. We have a public hearing tomorrow, but uh, so I will just say uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, wish you all the best of the season. Hope you get lots of opportunity to uh, spend time with families and enjoy your community. And if you're getting in the car, you're going too far. Uh, stay close to your own neighborhood. <laughs> happy Merry Christmas. holidays. Merry Christmas, everybody. Christmas. Happy Thanks. holidays. Happy winter. Bye.